Well, good morning, everybody. So we already know that we are very, very close to the halfway point of 2022. And in fact, as I've predicted in all our previous webinars, uh, some of you are new here, but this actually is already our eighth, ninth webinar. And the thing is, what we have predicted so far is that the first half of 2022 was going to be a bit more on the peaceful side, but that things will start ramping up from about May of 2022. Uh, of this year. And of course, uh, I promised everybody that I would be doing another webinar around May of this year, and here I am. So uh, by now, the audience already knows that when May seems starts with one of these webinars, you already know that events will start ramping up uh, from here on. So the thing is, of course, the very first thing that's on everybody's mind, first question is what's going to happen with the Russia-Ukrainian war. But also beyond that, I think if you're looking at the newspapers, the other very, very big concern that's on people's minds is with regard to things like the financial side of things. Now, one of the things that I shared in my November webinar last year was that at least for Singapore, and it's not just Singapore, it's for the rest of the world in various other countries as well. What I said was that the first half of the year in Singapore was going to be very peaceful, more or less it's been the case, but also our prediction had shown that events start to stack up just about May onwards. And we in fact see that right on time, even on a May Day address by the Prime Minister, he's already started saying that Singapore needs to prepare for economic challenges and that the government is doing all it can to cushion the impact. Now, what this tells us is that there is no guarantee that what's being done right now is going to be like all encompassing, it's going to take care of all the problems. And this is why it's very, very important that many of us, especially those of us who are in leadership positions, need to pay very close attention to what is happening in the world right now. Now, the thing is, a lot of people have questions like, uh, they've been texting me, people have been sending us emails to ask like, hey, May, your webinar's coming up. Is there going to be war? Will there be a recession? And in fact, I'll give this to you right at the beginning of my webinar, which is that, please, you actually don't need an astrology forecast to answer those questions. Because first of all, there is already a war. And the second thing is to ask, is there a recession? In fact, for many countries, it's already started. And uh, even if you're in one of the better countries, uh, I'm very sure that you already see the signs of it coming up. So what's important here is that you don't actually need to be an astrologer to know that the wind is blowing in a very different direction than it was just a few years ago. In fact, in the next few images I'm going to show you are pictures that you never imagined that you would see just a few years ago. We see in just the, in just the last three years, look at that. People saying that Hong Kong is dangerous. And we've also got the land of smiles doing the Hunger Games cat Katniss Everdeen thing. Thailand is getting angry with itself. We also have the whole world going into lockdown just about two years ago, and some countries are going in and out of lockdown too. We also see one of the big countries, the United Kingdom, doing a Brexit, losing all their truck drivers, and actually having images like this where your supermarket is completely, utterly empty. We also have people in the United States losing an election and then a bunch of people lose their minds. So the thing is, just looking at the images sort of give you a sense that the world just isn't operating in the same way that it was when we were all growing up. So that means we need to be prepared here. Now, the thing is, I don't think it takes a, a genius to know that today's forecast, I'm preparing myself because I'm aware that I might not be giving you very good news. And I don't think anyone is fully expecting the best news uh, in the, for the rest of the year and in 2023. Now, however, I'd like to put it to you that if today's forecast is a surprise to you, then I'd like to put it to you that maybe you haven't been reading the news or perhaps you have not been paying attention to what's been happening around us. So let's put it out there here, okay? So that we have to be prepared that, like, okay, great. So the, the news isn't great. But at the same time, I want to just sort of say like, you know, instead of asking, is it bad? I'm quite aware that many people are attending today's webinar thinking that, okay, you just want to know how bad, you know? But at the same time, let us just pause here a bit, right? Now, if you're here to know like, wow, this country, this and that, that economy is going to be this and that. Now, I'm going to put it to you that um, my prediction is that you're probably going to walk out of this webinar feeling sad, depressed and feeling lost. And in the end, what then would be the purpose of that? Quite frankly, I think that you have probably better things to do with yourself or on a Saturday morning. So the reality is that perhaps looking at just how bad isn't going to be enough. And I think we're going to need to take a bit of a different perspective. 
So if I, if I may, let me make a suggestion to everyone who is watching this webinar, is that we already know that there's going to be a storm around us. But what I'm suggesting is that, is there a way for us to sort of keep calm and to be able to understand what's going on? Because without understanding, you'll just be reacting. And what would be the point of that? And so, you know, guys, for you, this is going to be like a three hour journey with me. But just so you know, I've done weeks, months, years of calculations, just preparing for this entire period. And the thing is, you think you're going through an emotional, a psychological roller coaster. I'm the one doing the calculations. So the thing is, ultimately, we need to find a way to think about what's going on. So let me make a suggestion to you that just for today, are you willing to come on a journey with me? And that means that for the next two to three hours, I would strongly suggest that let's put a bit of the psychology aside. Let's put a bit of the emotions aside and all these whatever anxiety or sad feelings or negative frequencies. Let's just sort of look at the facts. Okay, so that you see the thing is we are going to be looking at different kind of timelines today i'm taking you on a journey of short timelines that means of the upcoming months maybe the upcoming years but at the same time i want us to zoom out and take a very macro view of things because if we look at some of the great civilizations i believe that there's um, a lot of lessons to be learned from the past and i'm going to show you what i see on the charts this is my promise and that you perhaps you will agree with me that some of the patterns that I see coming from not just a few hundred years ago, but from thousands of years ago. And it's very uncanny to me that the charts are identical. They are exactly the same. So what makes sense for all of us as intelligent beings is to understand that if it happened just that way in the past, does it then also make sense that if patterns repeat themselves, can we now be able to extrapolate and understand what's going to happen to us? And therefore, when we understand what's going on, then we know what to do. So the thing is, in a nutshell, what I'm going to be showing today is the fact that some parts of the world, and I don't mean countries, I mean systems, structures, they're kind of going to be breaking down a little bit. But you see, in this period of breaking down, let me show you what will break. But at the same time, I'm going to pause at specific areas in my webinar, and I'm going to sort of twist things around a bit and also show you what will work. Because even as I'm doing my calculations and I'm getting, even myself, getting a little bit you know, upset about what I'm seeing, but at the same time, I realized that if I took a different perspective, I'm like, hey, there are things that are already working. But I know that everyone's so upset about like, oh, you know, we are losing this and we are losing that. And we don't actually see what we are gaining. So at this point, I, I'm going to show you that today's journey might be a little bit of a, of a I, I need you to be, be prepared that we are going to take a bit of a different perspective. So the fact is, the world's going to be in some of these pieces, but we're going to look into history and see how did those pieces come right back together. And when we understand what this new system of putting things back together is going to look like, that means we can replicate it. And that means you are able to sort of look at your people, get, get your teams together, and then you kind of know what you can do right now in May of 2022 to start preparing for that new system that's going to be coming up. So without any further ado, let me just walk you through exactly how we are going to cover this. Now, part one of the presentation is I'll go right straight into the major threats that we are going to be facing right now, this year and next year. The first question I'm going to answer is that, is there going to be war in 2022? I'll show you what I see. Now, the second question is the financial question. Is there a looming financial crisis? Uh, and if you're listening to the economists, they pretty much tell you yes. Lah. Okay, so that's the nutshell version. Now, the thing is, now the part two here is who then is going to be the emerging power? And at this point, I'm going to remind you that this is not about speculation or, hey, you know who's going to be coming up here. But there's a very practical reason for why we're asking this. Because we want to understand what is that power going to be hinged on. And therefore, we can plan. And also, what then will the next superpower be? Because we know that that's how the new rules are going to be set up. So without any further ado, let's get started with chapter one. Will there be war in 2022? Now, in order to look at this, we need to take a look a bit at the world map. Now, I obviously didn't do the charts for every country in the world, but I've gone and focused on several of the hotspots that I think that we really need to pay some attention to. So let me show you what these hotspots are. The very first one, I'm going to start with Israel and Iran, and then it heats up a little bit closer to Southeast Asia where I am, and that's Pakistan and India. And then we are going to go to some place that hasn't gotten a lot of attention, but 
I think we should pay attention is in the Solomon Islands. And then we heat up even more by looking at Taiwan. And of course, the one thing that's on people's minds, Ukraine versus Putin. And then I'm going to round it off by looking at the situation in the United States. Okay, so let's get started. Now, the first one is Israel and Iran. Now, I'm, I'm very well aware I'm Singaporean and I know that for a lot of people, you don't really care. It's like, um, to you, it's like the Middle East, they've been fighting since forever, right? So what's going to be different about this? Now, there are two things that I want people to pay real attention to that in this particular conflict, these guys, they've got toys and their toys are big and their toys are dangerous. So the thing is, that's the first thing that in terms of the conflict, um, the, the, the impact is going to be a bit different. Now, the second reason is that right now, there are a lot of people with fireworks all around the world. And some, everybody's just waiting for someone to start the fireworks. And what this means is that if someone gets started, um, basically the party gets going. Okay, so that's why it's important to pay attention to what's going on. So for those of you who aren't aware of um, the story, the nutshell here is that Israel is accusing Iran of having uh, nuclear weapons or various other dangerous weapons. So right now, there are a lot of all these altercations between them. And Tehran has already said that it would hit back in response to the slightest step by Israel. So that the threat has already been issued. So I'm not going to show you all the very, all the detailed calculations, but it is enough that when we look at the, the charts of Israel, I see something here known as a yacht. And there are several indications I have reason to believe that Israel is a little bit trigger happy during this period. Now, this comes into perfection just about between September to October of this year. So you're going to start to see the tensions are, are going to rise uh, and there are clear indications of conflict, of, um, of being absolutely trigger happy by the time we hit October to November. So here's the thing. We want to do a bit of a cross check. So that means if Israel is going to be a little bit in an attacking mood, that means we want to know where then will the conflict be. So I've looked into most of the countries that, um, that are potentially going to be the recipient. And uh, I, I actually went and looked at Iran. But there are also indications that I've seen here that there can be some kind of fighting and potentially losses on their soil. So that means if there's going to be fight, it's possible that Iran is going to see some action this year. And uh, based on the timing that I see, it's very likely to show up just about October, November. So guys, this is how my predictions will work. Just by looking at one country, I can't always tell what's happening. But what I want to do is a series of cross-checking. So if one country is having this action, and around the same time, if another country is having a similar action, that means we can then speculate and, and extrapolate that it could be some kind of action going on between these two particular countries. And that's what I'll be doing for the rest of today's webinar. So first of all, we see Iran and Israel, one possibility there. Now let's bring it a bit closer to home. When we look at India and Pakistan, now the reason why I started looking into this area was because of a particular newspaper article that came up uh, just in the middle of March, where there was an accidental Indian missile launch that landed in Pakistani territory, which was very, very close to their capital. So at that time, the world actually held its breath because we didn't know if this meant that these two countries were going to get into a fight. Now, of course, it's been a couple of months since then. And as we all know that there hasn't actually been a fight between these two countries. But I would like to show you what I see anyway, because I think that there are some impact going on with these two countries. Now, the first one is Pakistan. And the reason why I got a bit worried at first is because there was this pattern that I saw here. Now, it, it tells me that Pakistan is going to do something naughty, that they are going to be irresponsible. And if you look into history, there have been times when Pakistan has gone and done some pretty silly things um, against India before. So what happened was when I saw this, I needed to look deeper into it. Now, however, the patterns that I see here is that the naughty thing that Pakistan is going to do seems to be a little bit more economic than military. So what I see here is that even the, the kind of trigger happy naughtiness seems to happen in the area of monetary differences. So what I'm showing you, uh, but of course, uh, I'm not going to show you the full calculation here. 
Now, I'm aware that quite a few of you have been very, very supportive of this webinar, and I've already announced that there will be bonus content that I'm not covering in today's webinar. There's just too much to cover today. So I've done a, a separate recording, and those of you who are already on that referral thing, thank you very much, and my team will be sending you the bonus content where I'll be showing you much more detailed numbers of when these things are going to hit. Now, the thing is, what I see here is that Pakistan has already been on the watch list for defaults. So what this means is that um, right now, there are lots of countries that are kind of like teetering on the edge. And just as the fireworks could be just waiting for one person to start the party, when it comes to the financial side, once we start to see certain major countries begin their defaults, we could then see a domino effect. And what this, uh, when I see this very, very clearly on Pakistan's chart, uh, we could be expecting strongly that Pakistan might decide not to pay their bills. And this also means that for some other countries, if they're not paying, why should we pay? And then we are going to see um, some of the systems absolutely fail from here on. So the thing is, when, um, so I've looked into India, because then just because Pakistan doesn't attack India doesn't mean India doesn't do the opposite. So, and, and the reason is because I've seen some very disturbing um, signs that there is going to be violence that's associated with India. Now, the thing is, this is an ongoing thing. It, it didn't just start like, like now. So some of these patterns have been there for a while, but the, the indications I see here, um, the dotted line shows something called a T-square in, in astrology, but it seems that the, the, altercations seem to be on Indian soil rather than them actually attacking other people. So India is right now involved in several potential conflicts, some of it with China and some of it with various other places. But um, if, if it's of any assurance to anybody, it doesn't actually seem like India is bringing the conflict outside of their soil. It looks more like an internal thing. And also, what we start to see is that a lot of these violent tendencies seem to be building up from about the October-November period onwards. Uh, but in India's case, it seems to hit a hit somewhere about January of next year. So what I have uh, in my research, it seems that a lot of this conflict seems to be more of a religious or an ideological nature. Um, and again, I'll be putting out most of this, these um, specific numbers for India in the bonus content, especially for those of you who may be very interested in how um, the, the religious and the racial tensions are, are playing out in India. But um, I think this picture says it all and that uh, there has been a, a very marked increase of uh, racial and, and ideological violence in India. And in fact, the calculations show me that rather than trying to put down the violence, it does seem as if some of this action going on in India actually has the endorsement of, um, of the leaders involved of some of the leaders involved. And that is the reason why um, if you see an escalation in India, that could be one of the very big factors here. Uh, I can't tell if you can see from the picture, but these guys are armed. Okay, so that's the other thing that you want to look at. Now, there are also a lot of rules that are changing in India right now. And one of the most recent headlines to have hit in just recent weeks is that the, there is a hijab ban in India. So what this means is that you should expect some of these tensions to show up between groups that already are not getting along very well. And uh, what we all want to be looking at is sometimes these things have a tendency to have a domino effect. And um, this is why it's, it's particularly important for those of us in Asia to realize that this threat is always present. And uh, we, we actually need to put in a lot of extra effort to make sure that people are still getting along because um, it's very easy for people to get caught up in, in that, that emotional uh, waves of, um, of action. Okay, so that's for India. Now, when we look into the Solomon Islands, let's be straight here. I mean, Solomon Islands is not a place that usually gets international attention. But I'm not sure if you've seen this in the papers, but very recently there was a, an agreement between China and, and the Solomon Islands. So some details of it have already been leaked into international media, and the backlash seems to be pretty major. So you see um, the Atlantic is really running headlines like there's a troubling new military strategy that Beijing's deal with the Solomon Islands is sparking concern among the US and its allies. So one of those allies is Australia. There, there's a lot of concern there because should 
China have a military or naval base in the Solomon Islands, they could be within shooting range, firing range of Australian soil. So that's one of the reasons why um, Australia is reacting now and the Prime Minister Scott Morrison has already called it a red line that they don't want China to cross. So what this means is that um, we could be looking at potential tension there. So what I'm going to look at first and foremost is the charts for the Solomon Islands. Now, this is what my timeline looks like. And let me show you how this works, all right? So if you look at the top row, you will see that the timeline runs from March of this year all the way to the end of next year. So, uh, and what we are going to see here is, even if you don't know much of astrology, that actually what we want to pay attention to is the black sections here. So, so the black sections um, are when we see a lot of this tension happening. And you can see that most of it, once we get to about January of 2023, that it seems to be a continuous strain of activity going on. And uh, this does not really bode well for the Solomon Islands. It means that we should be expecting. Uh, and in fact, you can see like at least from about March, uh, May of next year onwards, that a lot of these, um, the, the attention is being put there. So at this point, we can't actually tell who is involved. We only know that there's going to be stuff going on uh, in the Solomon Islands, but that's the reason why we need to do a bit of a cross check with other countries. So, but at this point, I also want to bring up something, a pattern that I've seen repeated across a lot of nations. And I've gone and drawn a line here where much of 2023 is. And you can actually see that there is a, quite a clear cut between the situation that seems to escalate from about March of 2023. People who are taking notes might want to write down that date because you're going to see that date happen multiple times in today's webinar. So the next thing is, let's have a look at what's happening in Australia. Now, the very first line that you see here is that confusion about laws and international politics. Um, you can see that between May and, April, uh, and August of this year is when it is at its highest. Now, some of you may be aware that right now it's election season in, in Australia. But you can see that this red bar runs all the way throughout 2023. And it tells me that right now, Australia could be misreading a lot of situations. The good news for most of us here is that at least for this year, because of election season, a lot of the leaders are getting their act together. So that at least a lot of the laws that are a bit like haywire they're, they're trying to to put things together so at least for the short term i don't actually see australia doing anything too silly for this year however the problem is again that march 2023 when the situation changes pretty quickly so what you can see here is from april of next year onwards i've i've written here that a liberation exercise can turn out to be a bit of a misunderstanding so that means if australia if i'm correct and a lot of these indicators suggest that australia might not have a good handle on what is actually happening in fact i would go even as far as to say that by about may of next year they they are in danger of bungling a situation Okay, so um, it's something that we want to consider, especially if I cross check it with the timeline of what's happening in the Solomon Islands. Now, at this point, I need to have a very clear disclaimer. Just because I am suggesting that there is a connection between the two does not mean that what I've described here on Australian's chart has to be the Solomon Islands because the charts don't tell me where this situation is going to be. We, we only can look at what's happening in different countries. And if the timeline seems to be somewhat similar, then especially with the political situation being what it is, we have to draw our conclusions from there. So I want people to be really clear that I'm not saying that it will happen in, in Solomon Islands. I'm saying that the timelines look uncannily similar. Okay, everyone good? Okay, so the, the thing is, of course, the, the other big player in the, the Solomon Islands story is China. So obviously, I spent a lot of time going into China's chart just to see is like, is, is Australia correct? And is there actually room to believe that China might be very interested in being within firing range of, of Australian soil? So I've gone and looked into that and uh, it brought me to looking at Taiwan first and foremost. So of course, Taiwan requires no introduction here okay i think everyone here is already aware of this ongoing i don't even want to call it a conflict i think it's more of a difficulty in defining certain boundaries where when it comes to, to taiwan um and i don't think this is a new story now however taiwan is right now on people's minds because of the russian invasion and that's why the next question that is on a lot of people's minds is like you know is is china going to do something about taiwan 
And uh, we can actually see that the escalation has kind of already begun. I'm not sure if you are reading the papers, because what I see here is that from May of this year onwards, we see that there is a reality check. Now, we already know that there are people in, in Taiwan who are, have been fighting very strongly for their independence. That is not new. However, what we see is that there's an escalation from 6th of May onwards. So that's about last week. And that means I started scouring the international news to see what might be an, uh, an event that could really bring this up. And because what I see, if I find something that has escalated from May of this year, I know that this situation is going to get pretty bad by the time we get to about August and July. So what we see, this is what I found, that uh, the US State Department has very recently, this is just a few days ago, mind you, that they have gone and edited a Taiwan fact sheet. And in fact, among the changes that are published, the new fact sheet has now eliminated a very crucial phrase, which is the, the position that the US does not support Taiwan independence. So the old fact sheet had something like that. So they respected the boundary. But right now, this very crucial sentence has now disappeared from their new fact sheet. So I'm, I'm no expert in, in politics, but what I can see here from a layman's perspective is that the United States is stoking the fires, getting some people quite upset about things. So they're trying to get people to react to a situation. So now we found it that there is actually an event that seems to be escalating this whole like, you know, China or not China thing. So what I see from the charts here is that, as I said, in July and August, this communist versus capitalist thing comes to a head. And um, what you can see from August, September, October, November, December, all the way until January is that the debate starts to heat up. So uh, what's actually going to happen? I don't know. But it does seem like people are going to be taking sides. Lots of people will be expressing their opinions. And especially at a time of, uh, of this kind of anxious tension that um, we could be look then, of course, the possibility of something bigger is going to be present. We've seen very, very similar patterns happen a few years ago in Hong Kong as well. So the thing is, the big question here is that, will the, is there going to be a clash? Now, what I see in about January, February is a swift, decisive end to the ideology debate. So the, what we see here is that it is decided once and for all what the answer to that question is. And that question has been around for years now. So the thing is, um, the other thing is, is are we expecting like a long drawn out conflict, right? Because it's like the, something kind of similar was going on with, with, with Ukraine. Like, are you like Soviet, not Soviet? And the thing is, it's, it's gone on for a few months. Now, what I see from this chart is that it doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to be a very fast, decisive re uh, end. So the chart itself doesn't tell me what that end is, but definitely it states that Taiwan's status is decided by February. And the thing is, again, we have that pesky line that shows up in March of 2023. And what you will see over and over again is that the situation that happens before the line and after the line seems to be a completely different story. And, uh, and although that is possible that from June of next year that there could still be a little bit of dispute, some people still have some opinions. But honestly, looking at the charts, I don't see that it is anything that is um, other than a bit of expression of opinion. I, I don't actually see... Um, any fights, somehow the fights disappeared. And that's something that we want to now think about what could happen such that there's no fight. Okay, so the thing is, let's look at China. Because now I want to cross check because if it's decided, if Taiwan's fate is decided, like does it have to be China? It could be from, from other factors, right? So I looked into China and we see that from about March to June, now, we are not surprised to see this. I, I've, I've written here an extreme experimentation with isolationist methods. By the way, guys, I'm very careful with my words. Uh, You'll have to like speculate and draw your own conclusions, okay? But what's been clear so far, okay, is that um, China has, um, in Shanghai at least, there's a lot of uh, these isolationist methods right now, uh, mainly because of their zero COVID policy. But uh, we also see that the right now China is not very popular. Like the, the people are, they, they, don't, they don't really like what's, what's happening right now. Plus, China is going through some economic difficulties because the lockdowns also mean that there are a lot of economic activity that is not happening. So it's resulting in an actual loss. Uh, we also see that the stack up is between April to June, which is pretty much now, and people are like like angry, right? So 
moving on from here, for the rest of the year, we actually see that the people are going to start protesting. They don't like being dominated. So there could be some noise there. Now, you also see that I've written here, pushback from the people and the children. And you notice that I've made a, a clear distinction between people and children. And here is my speculation that at least as China is concerned, that there could be in, in the astrological charts, there is a section for how a country deals with their people. And yet there's also a section where we have children, especially if you have children who might be throwing tantrums in that sense. So um, again, we see that uh, the tensions start to rise from about August all the way to about that January, February. And uh, by October, you can see there's a stack up here in October where, where everything is sort of happening at the same time. I also see indications of a solar eclipse that suggests that China may change some rules. And we are all aware that um, they can do that, right? That means they can just change some rules and um, have people operate in a different way. We also see that a lot of the isolationist methods that have been we have been seeing in the past few months seem to escalate from about September onwards. So there are there are things that China uh, can and uh, are able to do. So what we see is at, at the last part here in January and February. Now again, February. So when I cross check, I'm looking for when the timelines match. Yeah. So that um I see here that there is a show of force, authority, losing temper. So I'm very aware that I'm looking at countries' charts. But honestly, if this was a human being, I would essentially tell my client that um, you have a child that's throwing a tantrum in the shopping mall. And sometimes um, what some parents do is they just smack the kid. Lah. And sometimes when you smack the kid hard enough, then the kid stops throwing a tantrum. So the thing is, um, that doesn't always mean that it results in a war. It just means that the parent wins. Okay, so um, this is what uh, I see here. Now, again, let's put in that line, that March 2023 line. And astrologically, the pattern looks very different because somehow after March of 2023, the indicators show me that the children have calmed down. And right now the children are on their best behavior. So it's like everybody's okay now. It's Christmas and everyone has, has gifts now. So the thing is, um, from about Ju July onwards, there seems to be a spread of philosophy and, and education. And as far as I can see, um, I don't honestly touch my heart. I don't actually see um, a very large or clear indications of conflict or war. That, so that what this tells me is that when we cross-check back with what we saw in the Solomon Islands, uh, I'm not entirely sure, I'm, I'm no political expert, but um, it's, uh, it's quite possible that if we are misreading the situation, uh, it might not be an actual intention to attack uh, anybody as of this point, at least not from what I can see on the astrology charts. Uh, I highly recommend that you go, if you're interested in this topic, I, you should probably go speak with a political expert. I'm no political expert, I'm just the astrologer, okay? So um, I, I don't see China getting into uh, a conflict here. Now that is not to say that China isn't uh, definitely not going to fight with anybody. I'm saying that, not, that if there is a fight, if there is a conflict, it's not big enough for it to actually show up on the astrological chart. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So next thing is like, uh, let's go to the big one, right? Which is people want to know what's going to happen with the Ukraine and with Putin. Notice I didn't say Ukraine versus Russia. I said Ukraine versus Putin. So, um, so let's look, have a look at that. And uh, when it comes to Ukraine, I mean, obviously right now, okay, let, let's do a bit of a, of a, like get up to date, right? So this fight has been going on for about the last two, three months. Um, I think the world has been very impressed by how the Ukraine has, um, has, has reacted so far. They fought very, very bravely, a small power versus a big power. But we also see that the world is slowly starting to get involved in this. And uh, depending on what you read in the media, I don't know about you, but I did so much research for this webinar. And after a while, I started to get a bit confused about what's actually happening. Some news articles say that Putin is losing the war. Some uh, news, uh, news articles say that they're actually kind of strong and that they're still going strong. Um, just a few days ago, it seems that um, it was announced that the ruble is the best performing currency in 2022. Like how, how is that working, right? I mean, the, the sanctions are supposed to make him weak. So the thing is, um, I, I think at this point, my, the only thing I can promise you is I can show you what I see on the astrological charts. It may or may not match what you see in the newspapers because um, I'm not really sure what I'm reading in the newspapers anyway. So here's what I see. That obviously for, for Ukraine, they've already been suffering for a few months now, but I've started my calculations from about May, this month onwards. So I see here that there's a lot of this idealism. They could be misreading other parties as well. 
Um, but it does seem like um, there is indications of giving up. That's what I see in, in the charts, which makes me personally a bit disappointed because I, I like rooting for the underdog, right? But the, the truth is, um, if you are reading the papers, it seems what I've read is that Zelensky is trying to find ways to talk about peace. I think they are they are quite tired of the fighting and the, the cost is very high. So we also noticed that from about May onwards that there are some serious negotiations going on and that Ukraine is taking a less brash attitude towards what's happening. Now you may recall that when the war first began, uh, Zelensky had been very critical of a lot of um, the, the organizations. He There have been several articles talking about how he literally went and scolded people for not helping Ukraine. Now, a lot of those um, have started to die down. I've definitely noticed that. And uh, it seems that the, a lot of the negotiations are going now behind closed doors. Okay, So that's the other thing that you want to pay attention to. That um, Also, I see clear indications of what uh, astrologically we might call a deal with the devil. And the, the reality is, when we talk about this devil, I know how it's so easy to just sort of think like, okay, is it Putin? Like Putin is the devil, right? Yeah, that, that's what a lot of people are thinking. But you see, the chart doesn't specifically say it's Putin. So that means they are, there is a political transaction going on. And what you should notice is that it started as early as March. So the thing is, it's not like a now thing. That means the transactions have been going since March. That's what I see from the charts. And then the thing is, maybe at the beginning, Zelensky might not have been so open to listening, but um, the charts, look at what's happening in May. Everything is stacking up here. And from here on, the proposition is sounding more and more attractive, that eventually when we get to about November, December, it gets seriously attractive. And the thing is, um, uh, let, let's go further, okay? So I, I see a yacht here, and it's pointing towards um, some, some stuff here in the chart, but um, this also tells me that I think the Ukraine is becoming more and more open to this idea of peace. But the question is, what would that peace entail? So when I see that from October onwards, there is clear indications that the fight starts to fade. That means for whatever reason, they are not continuing. Now, I'm no expert in what's happening in Europe. After all, I'm just a Singaporean, right? But um, in October, from what I understand, is when it gets really cold in, in Europe. And uh, when, when it's very cold, people need fuel. And, uh, and sometimes when you need fuel, you have to make some concessions because people are freezing. So the thing is, um, the good news here though, is that what I see here as the suffering of the people actually ends just about January. So I know some people are getting a bit worried about what's happening in the Ukraine. Your heart is bleeding for those people. The good news is that the, the suffering fades away, the suffering ends. Um, but as, the, as they seem to come to some kind of a conclusion just about between Je December to February. So the good news is that it seems that there's going to be a ceasefire. Um, I think it may be a bit too much to, to expect that the war is going to end decisively, but definitely um, the chart suggests that there is a ceasefire, that they're going to stop fighting for a while. And again, you see how conveniently that everything seems to be wrapped up very nicely in February, isn't it? And we, we seem to have that pattern over and over again. And the funny thing is, after March, the funny thing is the big thing in, in, in Ukraine seems to be that the people are not very happy with their leader. So the thing is, right now, Zelensky is um, quite quite a, a hero, an international hero. I quite like the guy myself. But the thing is, um, the charts actually sort of show me that he's under extreme stress, extreme judgment from here onwards. So what this suggests to me is that in return for peace, in return for like stop bombing my people, there are concessions that he might need to make that um, it's quite possible that that unless you put yourself in his position, you, you might be faced with a very difficult um, choice to make and concessions that um, some people may not be very happy with him accepting. So the, the question here is then who, who then is that devil? Okay, so I'm going to show you a few more things and perhaps you might want to draw your own conclusions. Uh, quite frankly, I, I got too many possibilities in my mind right now too. Okay, so um, I also want to sort of bring in the fact that I, I know quite a large number of you are already on my Telegram chat, but um, because this is such a huge topic, uh, I anticipate that I will be putting up more uh, more updates as we go along. So if you would like to be part of my Telegram group, uh, I just want to put in this QR code. If you're not on it, you can just scan it and get on my Telegram. Along the way, uh, we'll, be, we'll be updating people. Okay, so go ahead and scan it. If not, I want to go next slide already. Yeah? Okay, so the thing is... Um, now, Putin, when we look at Putin's chart, it's a, uh, I mean, we want to do a cross check, right? 
So obviously he's had a lot of stress in his homeland, that's for sure, because then around March is when the, the sanctions showed up. And we definitely know that uh, he's the master of a curveball. I think he's done a few things that people have um, described as being quite unpredictable as of now between July to, to October. But it seems that a lot of his uh, curveballs are going to backfire around that period. And then the funny thing is I see that from about October, you can see the stack up that happens here with all the black stuff that he's starting to concede power. He's becoming a lot more negotiable from about October onwards. So it does look like some of those um, sanctions might, might start kicking in. I'm, I'm not really sure you have to talk to a real expert because I'm not. But um, it does look like the pressure is very, very high on Putin by the time we get to about October, November. Now, this could also, when we cross check it with what we see in, in Ukraine, uh, it could be that um, that's why all the parties are a little bit more open to potentially a ceasefire. And similarly, we see that a lot of these uh, uh, agreements start to fall into place by the time we get to about January of next year. So like I said, the good news seems to be that at least we might stop fighting for a while. But you know, again, it, it very neatly wraps up in February, doesn't it? And then we see that again, the, the, the story changes once we get to 2023. So we see that from about April onwards that uh, Putin is in a very frustrated position. So the thing is, I'm no political expert. I'm not from the US, like, you know, United Nations, whatever. But what I'm thinking in my mind personally is that uh, I'm not sure how far they're going to let him get away with this or, uh, or what kind of, um, what kind of re repercussions that he might have to face. But what I can see for sure that he is very frustrated from about April onwards of next year, and that the need for power becomes a lot stronger from about May. And the thing is, it shows here that he gets more and more powerful. By the time we get to about August, he's ready to make decisions, very big decisions. And uh, I'm not going to speculate on what those decisions are. But the reality is um, the charts very clearly, the one thing that I am willing to commit to is that Putin is very frustrated next year. He's not in a good place. So then, of course, the big question that a lot of people are thinking about here is that then the other big player that I have not spoken about here is the United States. Are they going to intervene? And it looks like it. Because then you can see, like, basically, they're, they're issuing contracts left, right, and center, right? So even as early as April, you see, like, Lockheed Martin's got getting all this stuff. And then you see, like, hypersonic cruise missiles are going on. Um, contracts are just coming in hard and fast. Now, we also see that um, we also want to pay a lot of attention to what's happening in the US. Now, a lot of these forecasts, this, there, there are, what I'm looking at is, indicators of does it look like the US goes to war? Because what I've shared in my very recent Telegram podcast is that while we already know that there's a war between Russia and Ukraine, but the big question on most people's minds is that is it going to be a world war? Now, we already know, at least with World, one, world War One and World War Two, is that people can fight, but it doesn't become a world war until the US gets involved, right? So for me, this is the deciding point. If it looks like they get involved, then okay, yeah, we, we might have some room to say that there could be a world war. So the important thing is that as I'm looking at the charts, I'm very, very clear in my mind that there are two kinds of wars. And that I think at this point is that the USA can fight both, but not at the same time. Now, what do I mean by this? Now, this slide, I had first presented it in November of last year. And you'll see that the, the first timeline is from very long ago. We are looking at like more than 100 years ago in, in the 1800s. So you may not need to know astrology, but you can see that there are three astrological indicators there. Doesn't matter what they are at this point. But you see that once they run out, immediately after that, there is an American Civil War. Now, the second timeline that I'm showing you here is much more recent. And you can see that it's in the 1939, 1941. This is just before World War II. So what we see here as an astrological pattern is that every time these three things show up in, in America's chart, that very shortly after that, there is war. So the thing is, for me, when I see these three things, as, as you can see here that, oh, yes, before I, I show you the chart, you see that the only difference between these two is that when it is the IC, it means that the war is fought on American soil. When it is the MC, the fight is outside of America. Notice how in World War II, besides Pearl Harbor, right, as in there wasn't an actual fight in America. Um, that's why we want to pay attention to which one it is. So I, I didn't bother with like it, with it 
translating the astrology to English this time around. I've left the astrological indicators there. So you can see they look quite, quite familiar, right? The Jupiter one, the Uranus one. And we also see that it's Neptune crossing the IC. Now, the thing is, a lot of the behavior of the United States seem to be more similar to the World War II thing. So now they're like buying weapons and stuff, right? But the astrological indicators tell me that the fight may not be outside of US soil because it's Neptune on the IC. And the thing is, so when we look at the rest of this year, uh, no surprise here is that you see a lot of this aggression thing coming up. However, at least until now, if you can see the green bar that started from March all the way to December, is that there's a lot of discipline. If there is the part of America that wants to fight, they haven't gotten involved yet, which is up to now, that makes sense because this is a repeat of the pattern even with World War II because there was a lot of speculation about whether the US was going to get involved with the war in Europe at the time in 1939, and they didn't. So we are seeing the exact same pattern right now. The US is not fighting, at least not directly. But we also see that there's a lot of this idealism and disillusionment with the beliefs, laws, politics. And I know quite a lot of us here actually follow the US politics quite a bit. And uh, right now, they're, they're not very happy with their leader. And there are a lot of policies right now that are seriously being challenged in the US. Some of you might have noticed um, that the people are fighting among themselves about whether to allow a woman to have abortion or not. So there are a lot of internal domestic problems that are coming up. So the, the big question that we want to ask is if we have a, a war that is in the United States on their soil, are we looking at more of a civil war kind of pattern or is it more like an international war sort of pattern? So in my research, I found this, that someone said that the next US civil war is already here. We just don't want to see it, that nobody wants what's coming. So nobody wants to see what is coming and that on the eve of the first civil war, the most intelligent, most informed, most dedicated people in the US could not see it coming. It, it came as a surprise to a lot of people. And I think given our, uh, our ability to look into history, I think right now at this point, if people want to say that they're surprised, I think they are lying. So the thing is, um, where, what I see moving forward is that, again, is that pesky line, isn't it? The, the March line. And uh, let me just backtrack a bit here. So it seems that from about April onwards, uh, a new situation shows up. So if you look astrologically, if there's no precedent, it means that on the 7th of April onwards, um, an event occurs that, that creates like a, like a whole list of, of series of events. And that I see here that America is trying to avoid a material threat. Now in astrology, when we talk about a material threat, it could refer to a, a multitude of things. One could be a financial threat. So that means we could be looking at an issue with the, with the stock market. We could be looking at um, an economic issue. But we could also be talking about the material world. That means the stuff that we can see and touch that, uh, we, that could be a threat to the physical world of the US. Uh, a material threat can also be things like the values of, of a country, like for a country to decide what is important and what is no longer important. Whatever it is, we'll see that from about May to August of next year, it starts to escalate. And at first, the attitude seems to be boasting and bravado. It's like, uh, we can handle this, we are strong. Uh, at first, it's like that, even with international negotiations, it's like that. But once we see uh, August onwards, it doesn't seem to be, the, the bravado seems to fall a little bit and the confidence is not the same. Now, what, if I were to sort of go even further, from September onwards, now these red bars are very long. And what this tells you is that it's not a new situation. It's been building up since God knows when. So that what I see that is coming to a head right there in about September, October, is that there is a material financial reckoning and a lot of the structural weaknesses in the US get revealed once and for all. So that means the cracks, actually, they have to pay the price for the cracks that they are seeing right now. So um, that's, that's the one of the reasons why the bravado starts to drop a little bit by, by the time we get to September. And we also see that by the time we get to November, December, there are a lot of concessions that whoever is the leader of the United States at the time has to face the power of an open rival. Now, the thing is, the charts, they, they, there isn't a planet for like people's faces. So it, we can't always tell who the open rival is. Uh, and I want to say that the charts don't actually say whether it's an international rival or is it a rival within their own soil. Sometimes, I, like the way I tell all my astrology students is that 
um, when it looks like it could be a few options, sometimes it is all of the above. So whatever happens, it does not look like the leader of the United States, whoever he is in, in November of next year, um, is going to be in absolute control, not like the way America has been for the last few decades. Okay, so that means we have to contend with the fact that uh, we could be seeing an era change happen right before our eyes. Okay, so I'm not going to speculate on what this is. You draw your conclusions, okay? I don't want to go to you. Okay, so the thing is, um, I, and I have to really look at what the possibilities are. So this is what I found in my research that a US intelligence chief sort of uh, shared this just a few weeks ago, that as long as Putin is, is winning or he thinks that he's winning, that is, is very unlikely that he's going to need to take further action. But that if he felt that the, the war was being lost, then sometimes the irony is that that is what could potentially trigger an escalation. The United Nations has also issued this in March that while for a while we all thought that the nuclear war is, is not a possibility, they, they had it under control, but the United Nations has officially said that it is back within the realm of possibility. So no one is saying that this is going to happen, but I think for us to pretend that it is not a possibility is simply putting our heads in the sand. Okay, so um, that's something that we you have to keep in mind as we go further. So the thing is, then the question here is that then how about the rest of the world? Like cannot be like that. We all just sit there and wait, right? Surely there's an intervention. So then the question I want to ask you is that well, since the war already started and that you know the, the Ukraine is already at war. So the question I want to ask you is: is everyone helping the Ukraine, or are we just busy profiteering and getting all the PR headlines to look good? Big question, right? So how exactly has the world been reacting? Well, they're very busy condemning the war. Lah. That, that's for sure. Like, no one agrees with it, right? But this here's the reality that, you know, the, they've already said that the West has to stop financing Putin. We already know that the, the EU has given like up to a billion dollars to the Ukraine. But here's the part they didn't tell you that they gave a hundred billion to, to Putin, right? So the thing is, we, we know this cognitively and uh, we already know that Russia makes like millions of dollars a day from the fuel, that the gas makes more money. And the big question that we want to ask is, are the sanctions against Russia working or not? And I, in a recent article that I had published, it's that is, is the world sanctioning Russia or is it the other way around? And of course, the, me the media has one way of saying it. But at this point, I want to introduce this idea that the world is right now, the strategy is an economic strategy. You are trying to fight the war with dollars. But the thing is, when you look at somebody like Putin, who's looking at that world map, I have a funny feeling that he's not really playing the same game as the rest. In fact, people who know him well and who know Russia well are starting to try to explain to the world who doesn't seem to understand what's going on, is that the, the way you play this game is not by sanctions. And in fact, this is the pattern I see happening over and over again. And you will see this diagram, this little icon as we go along because I'm trying to explain what could work and what no longer works anymore. So what we see here is that the World Bank has uh, approved a bunch of loans. The IMF has approved a bunch of loans. The key word here, guys, is the word loans. Loans means you need to pay back. And uh, of course, the, the, the other side of the world is busy profiting from the war. You can see that, by the way, you can see the date there, March 4th. That's just barely a week after the invasion started. My God, these people, they are, they are their stocks are up by 20%. Awesome. And the thing is, so Zelensky has been calling for help. And in fact, um, people are suggesting that the debt is a very big problem for Ukraine right now because they are drowning in debt. They already owe $129 billion uh, from previous wars. And this year, just so you know, that all these people who are happily giving loans to the Ukraine are expecting them to pay $14 billion this year. And in fact, the interesting thing that I found online was that four days before the Russian invasion, the World Bank was preparing a large loan to the Ukraine. It's a bit like, you know, in four minutes, someone's going to punch your face. Would you like to take a loan from me? I'll, I'll give you some protection. You know, it's like, I'm not going to help you, but you know, if you wanted a loan, you could have one. So the fact is, um, a lot of times these loans come with a lot of terms and conditions. And the people of the Ukraine has already seen an increase in household gas prices go up by 650% ever since that the previous time they had a, a, a war in, in Donbass. So what I'm trying to show you here is that, can you see this, right? So that means the world, the only way the world knows how to play this game is Earth era style. And the funny thing is, you see, at this point, let's take a, a quick pause, right? That looking at all these conflicts that I'm showing you here, what I've noticed is that there is one side of the world that is being driven by an economic objective. 
that it's very clear that um, whatever, whatever game is being played here, the end game is to somehow get some dollars out of it versus there is now a rising group of people whose fights are now driven by an idea. And the reason why the United States shows up on both sides is because there are two very different sides of the US. And that is the reason why this fight is not between Russia and, and Ukraine. It is between the Earth era and the air era. Okay, so that's something that we all want to think about. So with that in mind, the next question here is that then what's going to happen to all that money issues? So let's talk about the financial crisis first. Okay, so of, of course, the, the big thing that's on, on the papers right now that I've been talking about in my recent articles and posts is about inflation. People are getting worried about this. So even as uh, Russia attacks, it's just gone up like big time. So people are worried about potentially hyperinflation. Is it possible that the US could go up to an inflation of more than a thousand percent? It is unprecedented, but you know that word, that word doesn't, doesn't have the same ring that it has ever since the pandemic. So what I'm trying to show you is that there is a very reliable astrology indicator for inflation and recession. So let me show you how this works. So if you look at this graph here, it's essentially inflation that's been around in the US since 1914. So some of it is because of the war, some of it is other things. So for now, let's remove the wars. Okay, so let's just only look at market factors. So we are now left with 1931, the Great Depression, and we also have the 1970s, which is the Great Inflation. Now in astrology, there is a, a pattern here. So those are, some of you watching this know astrology. So that means when the planet Uranus and Saturn are in a square position with each other, and uh, sometimes they occur at about the same time. So what we get is an interlocking bars that's here. So I tried to be as precise as possible with the positioning of my bars. And what you will notice is that if you look at the dotted line, right after the interlocking thing happens, you find that the peak or the worst part of the deflation or the inflation seems to come just after the dotted line. The same thing happened in about the 70s. We already know that the Nixon did that whole take the dollar off the gold standard thing. That was in 1971. But what you see here is that the inflation got, got two part A and part B, right? So in fact, once we see the interlocking bars, the peak of the inflation actually happened years by the way can you see here the every little bit here is one year huh? so this is years of inflation that happened after the dotted line so we all know how this works right so the thing is astrological indicators aside now economically there are a lot of similarities between the 1930s and the 1970s let's just take a look the first one is the oil factor now in the 1930s some stuff happened with the oil whatever and if in fact it started affecting the oil price in the 1970s, we saw pictures like this that they ran out of gasoline. So the political situation is different each time, but the result is the same. Then you see that all these people queuing up at the, at the gas station because they ran out of oil. So the 1970s were bookended by oil shocks. Now, another thing that happened at the time was that meat prices also spiked. So this is history. You can check it out online. I'm not lying to you. So what happens is right now, the Wall Street Journal is even saying that if you listen to the oil prices that are happening right now, it starts to sound like an echo of the 1970s. So that the other thing is the gold factor. And in 1930s, actually, the Frank, Franklin Roosevelt actually took the United States off the gold standard in 1933. We kind of forgot about that because the one that we all remember is that Nixon took the USD off the gold standard. But as of now, the USD is already off the gold standard. So now you go and speculate on what might happen now, because I think that uh, we've seen the oil factor happen, but we haven't seen the gold factor happen yet. Now, the other thing is that um, why we should pay a lot of attention to this is because the interlocking bars are happening right now. So by my calculations, the interlocking happened from February 2020, and it's still going. Right now, we are only May of 2022. We are right in the middle of it. Uh, I don't need to remind you what happened in February 2020. So basically the whole way into a pandemic situation. And if the, if the pattern repeats, that means we should be seeing peaks of inflation after the dotted line. That means what you see in 2022, you ain't seen nothing yet. We haven't peaked yet. So now the, the, the problem is that the pictures that we see right now look eerily similar. We start to see pictures like this, and then you see like all the cars lining up at the, at the gas station. Now I admit that a lot of these pictures are from Brexit, from, uh, from just a 
couple of years ago. But the thing is, what story leads to it doesn't actually matter. You can actually see that quite a lot of the oil situation, if you read the news and you can see that a lot of these situations are going to perpetuate for some time now. Uh, also, we, when we see like there's a potential even again for a meat situation. So for me, it's like when we see similar indicators happen, if three indicators means earthquake, then if you see these three indicators, what, kind, what can we expect from there? So the indicators show a repeat pattern. And right now, the world is still short of everything. By now, a lot of people expected that the pandemic is over, that we should be able to reproduce all our goods the way we always have done, uh, hasn't happened. And right now, Shanghai is in, still in lockdown. They are talking about potentially other ports in China being affected by lockdowns as well. At, at its highest peak, my understanding is that up to one in five cargo ships in the world were stuck in Chinese ports. So the, the fact is the supply chain is still facing massive disruptions. So to think that there will not be an inflation, I think, again, we have our heads in the sand. Now. We have to wake up to the, the reality of this. So the fact is it's already started building up. So if history repeats itself, we will see the full force of inflation hit us, potentially lasting for years after November of 2022. And uh, it's already started, right? So if you look at this graph, we are only looking at like 2021 numbers. And already the US and Canada, you can see the inflation is like trending upwards really. Even in Singapore, from 2021 going a bit into 2022, it's, it's coming up. Now, even if you are not a finance person, which I'm not, I can tell you I'm not, but the thing is, if you go to the supermarket, I, I'm sure we have all noticed la, that the prices are uh, noticeably higher. So that means inflation is already here. Now, and the thing is, I also want to point out to you that there's also going to be an oil factor. And if you look at this graph here, the top oil producing companies, uh, countries, you, obviously Russia is in the top three, and Russia is already playing games right now with, with the supply of oil. And then that means, well, we, we know what the US is going to do, but the thing is for Saudi Arabia, let's pay a bit more attention to them, shall we? So it's, uh, and those of you who are following the news, notice that this guy has been showing up in the news pretty often nowadays. So looking at my timeline from about May onwards, you can see a stack up. And in fact, I see indications of a leader thriving in some mischief. He started to realize that he's a big player now. And that uh, also he started having a lot of murky communications. So he started suggesting changes to agreements that have been going for a long time. Now, what exactly those changes are is your guess is as good as mine. But he started to become very businesslike. And in the past, he may have been a lot more diplomatic, more pacifist, but he's starting to realize that um, a few buttons in the right place could be very beneficial for him. And what, he's, what seems to be also rising right now is that there's a bit of domestic unrest. And uh, there are some suggestions that their supply or their, the infrastructure in Saudi Arabia is being affected by some conflicts. You do your research. You can go and see it yourself. So what I see here in the charts is that from about September, October onwards, some of these events or altercations may sort of increase in frequency such that it results in a disruption to the resource production. So that means as far as, as Putin is now putting his, his effect on oil supply, um, it quite, it's quite possible that Saudi Arabia might throw their head into the ring as well and decide that we want to play this game too. And, uh, and it seems that, again, look at how everything seems to sort of like, like culminate in that whole January, February time. And Saudi Arabia has already warned, official warning, that the world is running out of energy capacity. And they're saying things like, I've never seen these things. Okay, so that's what we are seeing now. Now, again, we have that pesky line from March of 2023. And look at how the colors have changed. Right after March of 2023, suddenly there is order, there is discipline for agreements, and the aggression has calmed down. What an about turn, right? And we also see that from about March onwards, there's international power and clout for the leader. So it does seem like he is going to play his cards right. And uh, that's for the people who are more familiar with the oil thing. As I said, I'm, I'm not really a finance person. You might want to go educate people about how this might play out because I sure don't know. Okay, so then the thing is, which other parts of the world is going to be affected? Uh, the obvious ones here is like uh, Mr. Boris Johnson is under a lot of stress now. He is, um, the UK is not faring well. 
and as of March already, inflation was at 6.2%. Very, very high for a major country. Now, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the UK. I already talked about them in November. You can go check out my previous November webinar. Uh, and also, those of you who are receiving the bonus content, I will be breaking it down to sort of show why the UK and some of the political changes that are happening there could have ramifications for, for Europe. Okay, so I'm going to put that in the, in the bonus content. Now, another country that I want to pay attention to is Australia. This picture is from uh, protests that are on the streets right now. Uh, property is very expensive in Australia. Uh, I understand that homelessness is on the rise because rents have gone up. And um, the recent statistics show that millennials like myself could take up to 11 years just to save up for a deposit for a home. So now it's a, it's a big problem because they have election right now and lots of people are very angry with the government. So the housing issue is a big issue. And uh, recently we've had a, a solar eclipse and uh, the, the positioning of the solar eclipse suggests that the situation could potentially escalate uh, in Australia in the coming months. So if I were to just put up my economic forecast, that, uh, of course, right now it's being election season. I think there's a lot of uh, genuine effort, la, or at least there are people are putting their brains together to try and solve the problem. But um, right after we see from about August onwards, the financial consequences of any of these solutions will get reviewed. By the time we get to about October, November, people are going to realize that we can solve the problem, but there's going to be a high price to pay. That's what the charts say. And uh, of course, we see that there have been a lot of difficulties with housing, regular people are having a hard time. That the good news is that it ends in December. So for whatever reason, you can see that December, everything stacks up. It does look like at least there's going to be a short term solution to the problem. And, uh, and for a while, people are going to be lulled into thinking that, okay, we, 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 we're going to be okay with this. However, like I said, uh, Australia is going to get involved, I think, with some international um, um, difficulties. And I've also seen here that from April onwards, there's potential of financial upheavals for the regular people, for your households, um, for property specifically. Now, I'm quite aware that um, potentially quite a lot of my audience, you might uh, have invested in, in Australian property and it's just something to review. I'm no expert. You might want to go and talk to somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. Um, but my astrological charts don't look very good for Australian property. Just, just saying. Okay, so that's um, what I see for Australia. And uh, I, I might just take a glance at Singapore. Okay, and I know we are concerned, especially as uh, it doesn't help that like, the Prime Minister has sort of suggested that we kind of need to sort of buckle our seat belts for a potential roller coaster. And um, there are a few things that are hard facts. It, it's, it's just a factual thing that, the, that even if Singapore is peaceful and everything is running well, the reality is that this country relies on imports that we literally buy just about everything. So it also means that with the supply chain disruption, definitely that there is no domestic production that we can fall back on. There's no farms or places for us to hide actually. So the, the reality is um, we are going to be affected. But I also want to tell you something, right? When I look at the, the charts for Singapore, just in case people are like panicking or whatever, right? it actually looks, uh, <laughs> this is very weird, huh? uh, it actually looks quite peaceful. Okay, so let, let, let me show you. Okay, so other than the fact that yes, we have a, a bit of a, a, an inflation problem, that one is for sure, la, sorry. La, okay, but um, we also have a lot of some of these concerning news. La. Very recently, in, Indonesia has said that they're going to like impose some bans on palm oil. Uh, but also, I think this is, this is not the end of it. And I, I, if you go and look into the speech um, that the Prime Minister has just said, he's also mentioned that there are possibilities that some countries are going to change the way that they do business. Some people might decide that they don't really want to do business anymore. So which means um, that possibility is always there. And it means that for us as business owners, for us as people who are operating in, in, in industry, we have to kind of wake up and smell the coffee, you know? And so, um, let me show you what I see in Singapore's chart. And it's a very different story, by the way, from what I see in other countries, yeah? So the first thing I want to bring up is in April onwards, there is an indicator of finances or resources of the country now becomes at the control of what I call external big boy forces. Uh, this thing is known as a progression and it will last for a very long time, 35 years. I'll be in my 70s by the time this thing passes. Now, some people may say, but you know, may 
our finances and resources have always been in the control of big boy forces anyway we are such a small country right but for the large part actually singapore has been able to uh, have quite a large say la, in in things that happen to us i suspect that uh, a lot of our policies will be a lot more influenced by big boy forces okay so you draw your conclusions but uh, it seems that in 2022 at the very least um at first, the country seems to, to adjust quite well. So obviously, the country is prepared to make a lot of changes to the way we manage resources. And for the large part, you can see all the green bars that the people are quite disciplined. Everyone understands that there's going to be a bit of a difficult time. So everyone is very cooperative and we are very restrained. So that, that's, that looks good. And it's, it's a lot better than we can say for many, many other countries. But what I also see is that along the way, now that's not to say that everyone is going to be happy in that obviously there are going to be some uh, changes to the rules. And that means uh, we could see some changes to the leadership situation. Okay, so other than the obvious, but there are, there are other things that people are leaders of. And uh, also we might start to see some disagreement from, from the workers, not just, um, not just if I, I think you also want to pay attention to the economy where um, some of these changes will, it will impact how we do our work. And uh, I'm not talking about something silly like lockdowns or whatever, because if there are changes in policy means we kind of have to change how we do things. That means uh, now but from September onwards, it is not unusual because now that I've shown you what's happening in other countries, for sure, Singapore is going to change the way um, some things work here. And uh, I've, I've written here a small thing here that could be a spotlight on foreigners, but I, I don't mean this in a bad way. I, I think what we want to be very practical about is that um, quite a lot of places in the world is not going to be so attractive because um, it's not stable and there are people who are angry with each other. And the funny thing is that Singapore is a very peaceful and it's a very beautiful country. It's, it's actually got a very good quality of life. It will be very attractive um, for people who may not be as lucky as us. So that is something that you logically, I mean, logically, you will know that um, we are going to be very attractive. So that's something that you need to think about. Uh, and also, I think uh, along this period of time, because of the changes, uh, the pink section between September and March is going to be a slowdown. Okay, so you have already been uh, pre preempted with a recession. Now that could happen, absolutely possible. And also, I think um, for in terms of us being able to sort of recover from the pandemic, I've been saying since 2020 that uh, I know everybody's waiting for like when will COVID end? Well, it kind of ended. And I kind of told you from as far as two years ago that the ending of COVID isn't going to be the recovery of the economy. And uh, if, if you can't agree with that now, then you will need to read more newspapers. Lah, okay, so that means that the good news is that a lot of these things start to sort of taper out later on. But um, the funny thing is, if I were to draw that pesky March line, lah, it's a bit different from other countries. You know, we don't have that nice ending. So Singapore works on a bit of a different timeline from everyone else. And uh, what I suspect is that because we're not really a big player lah, in, in the big story, right? So it then it makes sense that a lot of our changes, if you look at it, the timeline a bit moved two months later. So that means what happens in Singapore, I logically speaking, it's going to be a reaction on what's happening to other countries. So what happens in, what can we expect from 2023 is that there will be a stricter control of um, systems and domestic matters. And you can see that the, the black stuff starts to accumulate from about May of next year onwards. Uh, we also going to start to see that the rules become a lot less clear cut. Singapore has always been known for very clear rules, but I think uh, naturally speaking, knowing what we can see from what's happening in the rest of the world, to be fair, sometimes um, there needs to be some flexibility already lah, because maybe the rules cannot be so clear cut because we need to react quickly to what's happening to the rest of the world. Uh, and also around the same time, you may see that there is more control. So the control is not new, lah, it's been going on for a while, right? So there will be uh, more control over things like public communications, broadcasting. And I was just telling my team that uh, appreciate the Maysim broadcast while, while I, I still can do this. Lah. Okay, so the, um, eventually what we see is that there's going to be a bit more um, connection between uh, what is our communications, things like your devices, and you're going to see a lot of connections with value and uh, the way we think about money as we go along, because we already see that there are things happening in the United States that can make waves for us. 
So that's why um, from about August onwards, you will see that there will be very much better technology control. Okay, so that um, the good news is that Singapore is very advanced la, in terms of the technology, and that may mean that we can survive better than a lot of people expect. Okay, so that's the story of Singapore where people always think we're going to die, but you know, it's like somehow Singapore will survive. La. Okay, so that, there are a few things. I've done some research and I, I was very interested in this idea of like how technology can help us to survive. Uh, I thought you might like to know that um, we are doing a lot of studies uh, and preparing for something called a digital dollar. And this is the retail version of the digital dollar. So um, you, you do need to know that um, Singapore is getting prepared for the potential that we could be issuing a new currency. Okay, so that uh, this is a digital version of our currency. Uh, and in fact, although it's been said that uh, we are, there's no urgent need for a digital currency right now, but the good news is that we are very prepared. That, um, and you can see how quickly Singapore can react to things. You know, COVID happened, and I think we were one of the first few countries to have like trace together and a couple other things. So um, the reaction time can be very fast. While other countries are like losing their heads, it seems like Singapore will be very prepared. Um, it may not solve all the problems, but it does look like it can solve uh, some of the problems. Lah. And of course, um, there is the retail version of this currency, and there's also a wholesale version. The wholesale version is kind of already in place. There are a lot of experiments and uh, projects that are happening between Singapore and various other countries. So that's probably good news because it means that um, this new currency might be very accepted and uh, help to foster some uh, deals between us and other countries that it will be accepted as a currency. So uh, that's something for everyone to really think about. Okay. So guys, uh, I have um, spoken for about an hour-ish and I think it's time for a break, but I do want to tell you what you can expect after the break because then I'm sure by now people want to know what's happening in March 2023. And I'm going to show you what I see in the charts, uh, what exactly is going to change. And I think we better know what that March 2023 thing is because like it or not, whether it happens in Singapore or not, it's happening worldwide. So you better know. And the other thing that we want to look at is what is going to be the next power this diagram is from Ray Dalio. Uh, I've been following a lot of his, uh, his, his, his stuff online. And in fact, um, he's suggested, she's suggesting a few things from this, from this diagram. But I think here's the next question that we want to ask. Uh, who will be the next world power and what will that mean? So let me show you astrologically how that's going to play out. Okay, so we're going to take a 10 minute break. We are at 11.22 now. I will resume at 11.25. Okay, and I'll start shop. See you guys in a bit. Okay, good. Awesome, guys. It's 11.35. Let's get going. Now, before I go into the part two, I thought I just might give a shout out to the guys on my Telegram channel. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, we've now crossed 1,000 subscribers. And if you'd like to be part of that conversation, and I think that's very important. In the air era, the solutions will only come when people are talking directly to each other. And uh, go ahead and join the Telegram channel and join that conversation. Okay, so if you haven't already, you can scan that QR code and let's move on. So the, let's go on to chapter three, which is the astrology of power and how history is going to repeat itself. And I promised you that we are looking at patterns. In previous webinars, I went back as far as 800 years of calculation. This time around, I've outdone myself. I've gone 2,000 years worth of calculations. And let me show you what I see. So think about that. There's been a lot of this talk about looking at history and seeing how we can learn from that. So I mentioned Ray Dalio just now, and I think he's, he's awesome. Like he's put up a lot of uh, good studies and all. Now, however, the thing is, I, I have a feeling that uh, if you look at just this diagram, I know he's done a lot more study than that, but just this diagram alone is only the Dutch, the British, the US, and a bit of China. But 
if I may very humbly sort of mention on this diagram, I feel that his history not history enough. Because how many years has he has has he got on that diagram? It's maybe just that two hundred ish years since the more or less the British Dutch Empire. So the thing is, like, let's go a little bit further. And I can tell you that when I'm thinking about empires, the first two empires that really come to my mind, the first is the Roman Empire, the Great Roman Empire, and also the Song Dynasty in China, which I had talked a little bit about in some of my previous webinars. So let me show you that. When we talk about this transition from the earth to the air era, some of you have watched my previous webinar, so you know what this is about. But you see, a lot of people have been getting in touch with me and my guys, and you're saying, look, oh, I think I'm going to be okay. I feel like I'm transiting well. I'm surviving COVID. And hey, look, I'm doing this digital thing. Now, I think all of that is great. But I think also for us as, as Earth people is to realize that moving from Earth to air is not just about going digital. And let me show you what this is. Okay, so I know that some people are completely new to my webinars. So just bear with me when I just sort of explain what this Earth to air thing is, right? So um, I, I actually do this in much more detail in my past webinars. So if you want to get on my YouTube channel and go and see some of the previous webinars, I gave you the link over there already. But for the people who are new to this earth to air thing, what is it really? Now, there's something that happens every about every 20 years is known as a Jupiter Saturn conjunction. And every time it happens, it needs to be in a particular element, like usually fire, earth, air or water. Now, the, the reason why I make such a big fuss about this is because we actually had a, one of those conjunctions in December of 2020. That's around the time where I started my whole string of webinars to tell people about this transition. So that was when it moved into Aquarius. But if you look at the, the pattern that we've had in the past for about almost 200 years, we had an almost unbroken pattern of an Earth era. So that means that most of these conjunctions were in Earth signs. So of course, you all know that this is it, it coincides with the Industrial Revolution. That was around the time that a lot of these countries were signing treaties with each other, and they're all declaring independence from, from, the, from the British Empire, from the whatever empire. And it's also when we saw that the, the economy flourished. Basically, everyone got rich, everybody's buying properties, like playing the stock market or whatever. And then when we got to about 1981 was when I think the digital revolution started to show the early stages. And that's when and people like us, the millennials, uh, have started playing with, um, not with toys and we stopped climbing trees, but we were much more interested in pressing buttons on the electronic thing. So that's when we saw a bit of that, that shift happening. And then we kind of briefly went back to the Earth era. That, that's a, a good way of describing this is when suddenly we don't really care how many people Facebook is connecting us to, but rather we kind of worry more about the IPO price of Facebook, whether it has a revenue model or not. So you can kind of see like, you know, the, the air mindset and the earth mindset is a very different one. So what we also see is that from December 2020 onwards, see, here's the slightly worrying part is that basically the earth era thing doesn't come back. So that means that as the people who are coming up, so of course, there's, there's those of us old 4 who have been around for a while. Uh, and then there are young people. I'm sure many of you who are parents, you absolutely see this pattern that the young people kind of have a different mindset from everyone else who's here right now. Because those guys were their air era people. They're not exactly earth era people. So let's have a look at why this is important. Because we crossed that line already. We are here already. We are already air era and the earth era not coming back for another 800 years. You will not be around to see it again. So let's have a look at why, why am I bringing up the Roman Empire? Because I was very curious. It's like in my mind, I was thinking, okay, if we are potentially facing something pretty major, let's look at what happened in the previous empires. So of course, the Roman Empire actually, strangely enough, was also an earth to air transition. So what they had was a long period of uh, the earth era. So they were very rich and they, they had all these bustling cities and the economy was wonderful. And then they had a bit of the, the sneak preview, the air era. They went back to the earth era. So their pattern a bit different. Now, by the time we got to the year 392, the empire was divided. The king had two sons and then he basically said, okay, you take the west side and the other guy takes the east side. So that the, the Roman Empire was divided into West and East. Now, the, the one that we know of as being the Great Roman Empire is actually, direct, uh, more specifically speaking, we're look, looking at the Western Roman Empire. And after that, it sort of did this another, like a sneak preview sort of thing. And from 452 onwards, they entered the air era and it didn't come back until 800 years later. The problem was, 
the empire died in 471. And that was when the Eastern Roman Empire simply took over because the Western Empire, the Babo, were ready. So what happened was, right after this period of time, you can see it's all air era. Earth era don't come back for a long time. So the thing is, let's look a little bit at why, why is it that I say that there are a lot of similarities. Because if you, uh, I did so much research and I just extract the important one, yeah? So the Roman leaders had a difficult time playing, paying for their public works projects. They tried to rectify the situation by devaluing their currency. So they did this like 2,000 years ago. And then, so they had silver coins, but they started adding impurities so that we could have more coins in circulation. And then there were so many coins in circulation that the new coins that they made was basically more metal than silver. They not very smart. So you can actually see that the, the Roman Empire was definitely playing an earth game there. And what this also means for us, the takeaway is that if we are not paying a lot of attention, basically our money actually goes from like, like precious metals, right, to being, I don't know what, what is that anymore. Like, it's just black and white nonsense. Like. So you actually see that even going with, uh, this diagram is also for Ray Dalio, thank you very much. And uh, it's, you can actually see that when you have 100% at the top, so this is where all currencies, strong currencies begin. That they're always like fully silver or fully gold or whatever. And then over time, you start to realize that, hey, we started adding impurities to our, to our money until essentially the coin that you have right now has pretty much like nothing much in it, just so you know. And so the funny thing is that the Song Dynasty kind of did something, went through a similar thing. Now, it was to my surprise that the Song Dynasty also went through an earth to air transition. Again, a long series of earth time song dynasty was bustling they had the they had the silk road and there was trade with the west it was crazy and then somewhere in about the 112 something they had a north south divide so what essentially happened was that the mongolians started to get quite powerful around that time and there was a bit of a war thing so they, they started losing some of the empires the Xia empire the Jin empire but the fact was they ended up with a diminished version so that we, this is what we call the, the southern song empire and then they kind of went on for a bit they still got a lot of money and just so you know around this time they're busy printing money lah, okay and then but after that we kind of got to the air era and somewhere along the way, a very famous guy called Genghis Khan sort of like self-declared emperor. He, he wasn't actually the emperor, but he self-declared. And that's where we had uh, Genghis Khan deciding that I'm going to win this game. Uh, and after that, we sort of went into the air era. And just so you know, from 1226 onwards, again, it was air era and it never went back to earth era until our time. La. So 800 years, they had to wait, right? Uh, and the dynasty fell in, in 1200 something. And uh, yeah, so the great song dynasty was the Babo Moso. Then, and after that, it was like basically air era. So again, I did a, a ton of research about the song dynasty. And here's what I saw. It was like during this period of time, commoners became rich, regular people, because there was education, there was private trade. And then, so you found that there was, uh, it started to become a money economy. So what used to be farmers left the farms and they all went into cities because they just wanted dollars, la, because they wanted to pay tax and all that stuff. And also money supply increased 30 fold. There was the economic hierarchy was no longer in the hands of, of, uh, of, a, of a controlled monarch, but actually it was in private hands. That means regular people like you and me could own property. And it was a far richer world than they'd ever seen before. And of course, then people got a bit smart, then they start to figure out ways that they could play the money game. And after that, you found that the wealth inequality got bigger and bigger and bigger in the Song Dynasty. And what, what this meant was that it started to weaken such that when the, by the time the Mongolians showed up, I think they were not very prepared for what was to come. So again, you have another empire that completely played the, the, the money game. Uh, and they could not understand a new society showing up that does not play the money game. And of course, yeah, you see like, you know, today we are seeing this, like we've got like the real kings, like nowadays got new kings, right? And you find that there, there's a whole list of all these people you can read by yourself, uh, people who don't really pay tax. So the thing is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I paid tax for like very long already. Yeah? So the thing is, um, yeah, some people, they don't even pay one cent, just so you know. And then, so we want to see like, so why did the Song Dynasty stop using paper currency? They're actually known for being among the first of the civilizations to use paper, paper money. And it worked well for nearly a hundred years. But after a while, they, they were faced with the exact same economic problem as the Romans before them and countless later countries, which is known as inflation. And in the end, what happened was the Song paper currency collapsed in 1264. And just 15 years later, 
the dynasty, the Babo Meridi. So the thing is, I mean, we, we start to see some of these uncomfortable patterns. You know, this graph uh, until 2020 only. And we, we kind of know what happened in 2020. And a lot of people were printing money, but not, not everyone was printing money. So if you look carefully, not everyone is printing money. Okay. And we also know that this graph didn't just stop there. Lah. So I, I didn't show you the 2021 and 2022, but you kind of know like what trajectory that graph is going just so you know. And it also means that there's a vast majority of the world that is still playing that money game. And there are some people who are not participating. Okay. And what we see here is that this is our timeline. We definitely know 71 Nixon story, 2008, we had a global financial crisis. And in 2020, we had pandemic. So here we are, okay. We are here in 2022, just that in the air era. And the thing is, just for comparison's sake, well, that's what happened to the Roman Empire, and that's what happened to the Song Dynasty Empire, and that's where we are. Okay, so that means, um, I think it's quite important for us, that's why I say we have to detach ourselves uh, and really stand in that little bubble in, in, in the storm, and really sort of ask ourselves, okay, like, I, I, I like to think that we are a bit special, uh, okay, we are, we are on the throes of a historical change. So 800 years from now, somebody is going to maybe like see my YouTube videos and go like, hey, somebody saw this pattern some time ago, maybe. Lah, okay. But here's the big conclusion, right? That two of the greatest civilizations in history did not survive an earth to air transition, just didn't work. Okay, so the thing is, now we, we, a lot of people right now are making the mistake of thinking, ah, yeah, what happened to us? Lah? We are smarter and we, we kind of learn the same lessons. I'm not sure about that. I just know we are making the same mistakes. Lah. And that because a lot of these past events didn't happen in our lifetime so it's very easy to pretend that it never happened in history but that is actually not the case so you see the thing is um i i've spoken to so many people over the years and i like just like each of us to just think about it okay as we look at data even as we move into the air era i know a lot of us are looking at graphs and charts but let me question something about the charts that we're looking at because i look at charts all day because even if you talk to your insurance agent, your banks, economists, when you look at charts like that, the question is how far does their charts go? In fact, in all the research I've done, usually when I speak to most financial people, their charts go back maybe 20 years. <laughs> and sometimes if you're lucky, it goes back 40 years. Sometimes if they're interested in looking at economic patterns, they go all the way back to about Great Depression, thereabouts like 1931. It doesn't go be before that. In fact, I very seldom see charts that even go at, even f as far back as 1800s. And of course, when we look at things like histograms, bar charts, that one even worse. Eh? We're only looking at last year and maybe the year before. So the things, how to see patterns when we are so short-sighted. And also, even as we look at the Ray Dalio's charts, um, like I said, he only went back as far as the Dutch. And uh, even then, that's only about two, three hundred years. And this is the reason why you cannot see a pattern or you cannot use what has happened in the last financial crisis and the last financial crisis to assume that what is going to happen is the same as the previous financial crisis because you are not looking at the right graph. And for me right now, I, what I see here is that at least one advantage that astrology has is that it's, it's been around for as long as you can imagine. From the moment that people kind of notice that planets and, and stars kind of have a bit of a, a set pattern as they move around. Uh, from as far as the caveman period, we have already been able to see these patterns. Okay, so that means you will have to decide for yourself as a, as a member of my audience, um, do we look at the economist chart who only has a 50 year timeline or do you might want to pay attention to an astrologer who's looking at a 2000 year timeline? So that means the fact is at this point, I have told you what is going to end. But from here on, I'm going to tell you what is going to start and I hope you're ready and I hope you have your pen and your paper. Okay, so the thing is, how then can we look at this entire situation? Because I've just simply suggested that our whole empire is coming to an end and, and trust me, I got to have a lot of balls to say that, yeah? So the thing is, when we look at this storm here, how do you get into that space of the, the zenness, right? Because you see, uh, if we think like an air person, what's important is that you don't get distracted by the storm. There's a lot of like crap that's going to happen around us, but let's look at what do we actually focus on. So let me show you what is going to happen in March of 2023. And I would suggest the faster we understand this, the more we can become when the tsunami hits. So that means now when we do this transition for all of us as earth to air people, my belief is that it happens in three stages. 
the first wave actually already happened. So I started my webinars around that time. And we all know COVID happened and some companies died and various like supply chain thing. Basically, Earth era starts to show you that it doesn't work anymore. And then the, the second wave is when we start to get a real glimpse of what does it really mean to be operating in the air era. And this is something that a lot of us are going to have big difficulties understanding. Because I know this because I have big difficulty understanding it. And also the third wave is from 2025 onwards that, that actually like it or not, we have to live in the air era. There's, there's no way of, around it. So that means now um, let's focus on the second wave. And that's why I named my webinar the second wave. So now there is a planet in astrology that redefines crisis every time it changes sign. So in March of 2023, here's the punchline, is that Pluto, the planet Pluto will enter Aquarius. Now I know this is astrology. Let me translate to English for you. So when we look into a timeline, let's look into the past. So every number of years or so, Pluto will change sign. So let's look into the recent history. In 1995, Pluto entered Sagittarius. Now Sag, you can see from the, from the symbol there, it's a bit of a fighting sign. Now Sagittarius is about beliefs, sometimes it's religion, politics, and that's around the time that Osama bin Laden came into our consciousness. Suddenly there were religious wars being fought on like, I don't know, you correct, I wrong, that kind of stuff. And then shortly after that, there was the Twin Towers um, uh, the situation that happened and then the world changed because then we started to realize that it wasn't a safe world. And then from 2008 onwards that we, we moved into Capricorn. Now Capricorn will show you the nature of the crisis is that it shows the cracks in companies, in financial systems. And of course we had the global financial crisis around that time. And ever since then, we've had pandemic, we've had like, you know, various crashes here and there and scandals and all, all that stuff. So we, we've seen that happen. And that means we have to pay very close attention to March of 2023, because we are going to see a very different kind of crisis. And that's why um, it will explain all those funny blue line patterns that you see in all the funny countries that are going through really big changes. So the question is, what then does Aquarius mean? So some of you here are, are students of astrology and you know that Aquarius is about like the whole brotherhood, how we redefine how people come together. Okay, so let, let's just stick with that first, because this is not the first time that Pluto is entering Aquarius. So again, I'm going back into history. What happened last time that it went into Aquarius? It gives us some sense of what to expect. So the last time, most recent one that it, it did this change from Capricorn to Aquarius was in the year 1777. What happened then? So first of all, when I typed this into Google, the first thing that came up was something called a revolutionary war. And they called this the turning point. The very first line said that the British were still in an excellent position to quell the American re rebellion. Had it not been for a variety of mistakes, they probably could have won the war. So what do we actually see here? It's like you actually see that there is, well, the British confirmed were playing an, uh, an earth game. La. You know, that was the whole point of colonialism, right? And then there was a bunch of people who decided that they believe in something and then they fought. So what, what pattern did we see? If the year looks familiar, it's because that was 1776 was the year that the US declared their own independence. And shortly after that, they fought for it from, from the British. So what we see is that in 1777, there was a world superpower that was at the time the British lost an iconic battle, Saratoga, for the first time in history. It's not la, but then, you know, they like to say it's first time in history, but it's not la. And also a smaller power at the time, uh, a colonial power like USA, rose and they championed an unthinkable, unimaginable, impossible reality. Because at the time, you needed a queen or a king. And when people said, well, okay, if you want to chop their heads off, then who's going to rule? And then they had this crazy idea that the people will rule. And then people scratched it and they didn't understand what do you mean by the people will rule because we need a king or a queen, right? And, uh, and the funny thing was that this new reality, it swept across the world. And here's what happened in history. France decided they were so inspired, they chopped the heads off their kings and queens. And then they had the French Revolution. And just in case you think it stopped there, let me tell you, Google is your friend, huh? Let me show you. Haiti had a revolution. Paraguay had a revolution. Venezuela had a revolution. Argentina had a revolution. Chile had a revolution. So did Brazil. And the funny thing is, as I was looking through all these pictures, right, they kind of look identical, you know, only the flag is different. So that means what, what we actually see is that there is a new ideology that sweeps across. And you may say that 
just years before this thing happened, people would, would say you xiao, uh, you crazy. Uh. But the thing is, it, it happened uh, in history. Uh, you can't say it didn't happen. No, this is real. Uh. So the thing is, these guys redefined what it meant to be Paraguay or what it meant to be Venezuela. And of course, you know that it happened mostly in the Americas at first, and then it swept across Europe and it went all the way to, to Asia. And we all know that because then everybody declared independence, right? Singapore did the same thing, but we, we took a while. Uh. So the thing is, what you see here is that when Pluto moves from Capricorn to Aquarius, what you see is a rise of this idea of people fighting for an idea. They're not fighting for money. They don't care about the money. They care about the idea. And so what the thing is, we are here, ladies and gentlemen. Today is May of 2022. We are less than a year away from March 2023. So you've been warned and don't tell me next year that you are surprised at what's happening in the world, okay? Because the astrologer already told you. So the thing is, now look around you. Let, let's try to see what, what is this thing, okay? So is there an unthinkable, unimaginable, impossible new reality that is rising right in front of you? Question, right? So let's look at, I know what you're all thinking. Let me show you others first, okay? So that, that South Korea just had their election not very long ago. And it seems that the young people are turning conservative. And in fact, um, right now, the fact that uh, President Yoon was elected means that a lot of people are asking questions about the, about how South Korea is going to deal with this idea of their democracy from here on. And in fact, um, his campaign had worked a little bit on, um, on the anti-feminist backlash. So what happens is uh, South Korea has done pretty well in the last few years. And I think a lot of it, there are other factors, but a lot of it also meant that the women had been very actively participating in the workforce. So if, if that is going to change, it kind of means that maybe there are certain ideas that are more important to South Korea than it is for the dollars that um, participation of certain people will have for the country. And we also see that France has just had their presidential election. This is a picture of a guy called Eric Zemmour. And uh, so it, I think you should really do your research and go see what Eric Zemmour has been saying. Now, he didn't get anywhere close to winning the election, but um, this is the kind of candidate who normally people won't even look at. But the thing is, he actually delivered quite a, a, like a reasonable amount of support. And I think uh, people should pay attention to this, like that people are voting for someone like Eric Zemmour. Now, on top of that, Macron. Okay, so the thing is, Macron won, but the problem is that his liberal base are old people. So you go, go do your research and it's all the old people who are voting for him. And the youngsters are actually kind of pissed with him, right? They're, they're saying that uh, Macron only helps the rich and uh, they're not helping us. And what Macron is doing is not helping our world. And I would suggest, listen carefully to what air era people are saying because earth era people they they're not going to last 30 years you know they're all going to die in 30 years time so what i'm showing you here is that there was a poll that was being done because election right and i found this online it's amazing they asked people what would influence your choice of vote so let me show you okay so if you can see on the graph it's from young people all the way to old people right so let's let's start from the right hand side the orange side so these are the retirees here we asked them what was the most important thing to you they said purchasing power i.e money lah. and then we asked people who are around my parents age and they also said purchasing power then we see the purple one these are the, a bit gen z gen x people right and then you see also purchasing power no surprise there lah. bread and butter issues right and then they go to people who are around my age the the millennial type people and oh my god they also said purchasing power then they went to another group of younger millennials and surprisingly they also say purchasing power eh. look at it all of us money face right and then when we look at that last category there these people are barely even adults they're just showing up in, as adults first time voting and you know what they said? The most important thing is the environment. And, and if you look at all the other age groups, uh, you know the environment is one of those low down, like low percentage kind of thing. Nobody gives a shit about the environment. Eh? And the only people who care are those air era people. So the thing is, Macron is shaking right now because the thing is you can win this election, not sure about the rest. Okay, so the thing is, the, the reality is the orange people are very soon not going to vote anymore. And then you find that the blue people will have more and more. Okay, so that's the other thing that as a business owner, as a leader in your community, are you paying attention to this? Because you better. Now, the other thing is that what we see here is that the world is definitely moving in the area of the air era, like it or not. So you see, like when we look at the young voters, the, it seems like the percentage of the people they are voting for are people at Mélenchon and Le Pen. Now, Mélenchon is talking a lot about like, like climate, um, climate 
initiatives, changing things, taking stuff away from the rich petrochemical companies and, and making change. And people are, look at how they're voting. Macron is barely getting 18% of the votes here. And, and the thing here is that one interesting thing that we are noticing in France is that the young people didn't bother to show up. They don't care about the vote anymore because they said politicians are not helping the people. They also, now, abstentation rate, which meant they didn't even show up to vote. They couldn't be bothered. 46%, half of the young people couldn't be bothered to vote. And in fact, for the Gen, Gen Z, abstentation rate was 42%. That's almost half, eh, guys. And what this means is that the French no longer see voting as a duty. But when I saw this, I was very surprised because the fact is the French were among the people who, who campaigned for this demo, dem, democracy thing. They are, the French Revolution basically was the model on which a lot of people built their democracies on. But the French are changing their minds, I can tell you that. So the thing is, when I look into the chart for France, without looking at all the fancy stuff, the fact is there are a lot of indications showing that there are a lot of social changes. And I think their values are changing rapidly and how they want to run the country is changing. And if Macron is not paying attention to that, that's one reason why he's going to be in trouble. So the thing is, I'm not going to go through all the various bars, but what you want to pay attention to is that, that line again, the March line. And you can see, again, the story very different. Now, the first half here in 2022, we start to see a lot of the rise in the social fractures. They are quite angry. The French people want to go back to being French. They feel that their culture is being eroded. Then there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of mixing. There's a lot of dilution. And they're very unhappy with certain cultures that have um, sort of showed up in recent times. So the work, working relationships have been shaken up. And the thing is, when we go into about September period, we start to see that, um, especially with some of the timelines I showed you before, that some of the obstacles in their international friendships will start to get shaken. So people are getting more and more angry. Now, what happens is after March of 2023, you find like the multicultural cracks will widen. And on top of that, there will be a lot of intense opposition to the current system, which asks people to share, share their streets, share their working environment, and. Uh, I think people don't want to share anymore. And then once we find that we move into the May of 2022, that we are going to see a change in the population, they will want to become much more conservative. Uh, and this French nationalism is starting to rise very, very, very strongly in, in France. Uh, do your research. Don't take my word for it. Okay. So the thing is, that means now what the pattern that we see very clearly is that in 1777, there were groups of people who decided that they were considering a new reality. Now, at first, they tried to ask nicely. So they went to their, their British boss and say like, uh, don't mind, do you think you can give us a bit of uh, independence? And British said, no. Lah. So the problem is it failed, right? So they had to fight for it. And that means, um, is it possible that during this period, there are some people suggesting a different way of doing things and uh, they're not getting a response? And that means they have to do something else. Now, right now, it is already happening. So it's like, uh, go read the news, lah, okay? So you, you can see um, in many, many, many countries, they are selecting, they're actively choosing quite a different kind of authority than what had seemed to work in the past. And it's quite shocking for a lot of people. Um, some of you know that the uh, Philippines has just had their election. I didn't have time to put it in my PowerPoint slides, but, but um, let's just say a uh, Marcos is back in power. So the thing is, and, and he won decisively. He didn't win by like 0.01%. He won by a lot. Leh. So the thing is, you got to start thinking, guys. Okay, so the, what? So the thing is, if we think like Earth people, and guys, I get it, you know, I'm an Earth person. Okay, so the, the change can be very uncomfortable if you think like that. But right now, I'm going to show you a different way of thinking because I want you to think like an air person. And that means if we understand that the world is choosing change, but I want to suggest from here on, why? So, so far, we only see the results, right? So let's look at who then is going to be the next superpower and what does that power entail? Okay, let's go into that. So Ray Dalio has suggested that based on previous studies that, I mean, it's, it's obvious, right? Everyone is talking about China as the rising power. So let's talk about that. Okay, if, if it's China, what does this mean? So now the case for China is that, first of all, they've done a really good job of setting up like all these systems around the world. If you are paying attention, uh, from what I understand, China 
actually owns uh, like a, a significant percentage of what Africa is producing right now. And uh, they not only have sea routes, they've got all sorts of things. And in fact, what I see here is in Myanmar. Of course, most of you know that uh, Myanmar has been kind of taken over by uh, the Janta. And in fact, uh, they have now pledged support for the Janta, no matter how the situation changes. So that means that's one vote for uh, and a powerful vote for the Myanmar Janta. Okay? And if you look at this picture, a lot of people may not know what this is. And I, I'll be honest with you, uh, before I did all this research, uh, I didn't even know half the things that China is doing. Okay? So now I, I'm sharing with you what I found online. So this construction here is pretty amazing because China built right across Pakistan. So that means they basically showed up and they, they built this thing that connects China all the way to the Indian Ocean. And, uh, and you can see it ends with a port there called Gawada. And Pakistan and China have done a deal, right? Basically, China has a lease for Gawada port for 40 years. Okay, so at this point, I, I just want you to think, right? A lot of these construction, it didn't happen like yesterday, right? You all know it didn't happen yesterday. It, it took like a long time. Eh? And on top of that, I didn't know this, huh, that they actually built a, a railway, a train railway that cuts across, get this, nine countries right across this thing so that it's meant to be a freight train. So it's like for cargo and getting whatever resources that China needs. Uh, and it, they can complete that journey in 18 days. It's pretty amazing. All right, so the thing is, at this point, right, I just want you all to pause a bit, okay? Think air era. So there is something here that China is doing and the most important thing I want you to think about is that they didn't like, they didn't do this last year. Fair, right? So that means this has been done for like, I don't know, I don't know how long it takes to build like a, like a nine country railway, 10, 20 years? I have no idea. And the thing is, if you look at this list here, all this wind power, solar power, digital currencies, everything that's here, I got this from Financial Times, yeah, that um, China is the leader of all of these things right now. Not sure about you, looks like air era to me. La. Okay, so the thing is, um, and, and the other thing that I want to bring up here is that we, we know this. We know that all this stuff is going to be big. Then the next question I want to ask you is that how come China is number one? And they are very dis undisputedly the number one in all of these things. Eh? How come like other richer, smarter, like more advanced countries isn't number one? So instead of getting angry about them being number one, right? Think about why are they number one? Okay, so think about it. And that they didn't do this yesterday and they did, didn't do this last year. It's been a 10, 20 year plan. Agree? Okay, so think about that first. Huh? And then you also realize that even as the world is getting a bit haywire now, look at who's voting for who. Because Israel has started to reshuffle their, their foreign reserve currency stuff and then they're starting to add renminbi, eh, the yuan. Eh. And on top of that, see, Saudi Arabia has started, I told you the guy is playing games, right? And he started suggesting that he might consider accepting the yuan instead of the USD. And that's a very powerful vote. Rem remember how powerful that Arabian guy is. So the thing is, now at this point, I just want you to pause and think like an air person, don't get angry first. But it's like, um, it, if we look at what is developing, and if you were a Chinese citizen, let's just say, okay, and is there a reason why um, you might actually feel a bit more secure going and, and you realize that they might not panic so much? And if I were to suggest that there is a government that has thought about what is going to happen and that they have planned for what is going to happen for the next 30, 40 years, in the last 30, 40 years, I think you can see where I'm going with this. But there are also reasons why a lot of people think that China will not be the next world power. So let, let's take a balanced view here. Okay, so there are problems here. Now, first of all, some people say that China is dangerous and that there is going to be a declining power, that they've hit their peak and then now they are having some problems. So I got all this from Western media. Lah, okay? And then also last year, there was a bit of an issue with their energy crisis. Quite embarrassing for China because they had blackouts and then they ran out of coal and, and stuff like that, right? But the thing is, um, from my understanding, I'm not an expert, please go and ask someone, somebody who knows, but my understanding is that with all these ports and the railways and, and stuff, it seems that China is taking a lot of steps to make sure that they will have the resources that they need, my understanding. Now, on top of that, when we look at the leader in China, there's, um, there's this sense of um, some people are suggesting that, you know, he, there are cracks within the, the party. That one, I don't know, like, you go and read yourself, like, okay? But also some people are suggesting that China is insecure and they are actually spending more money on their internal security than their external defense, i.e. suggesting that China is afraid that their own people 
will object I and mean, their own people don't like them. And of course, if you look into like TikTok or whatever nowadays, some people not very happy about being locked down. Lah. So maybe, I mean, I wouldn't be happy about being locked down either, but I just ask you to just think first, okay? And the problem is also that nobody seems to like China, like literally no one likes China. See, all these countries, the blue one is unfavorable opinion and the olive one is favorable opinion. No one likes China. So I, I suppose it's a bit difficult to sort of like be the world power if no one likes you, right? So then like, does that mean that people are not going to vote for China? I, I don't know. You think, okay? And also right now, I think there's this sense of like, that there's an increasing amount of like this whole laughing at China thing. Because then recently they had the zero COVID and then they locked all the people up and then Shanghai like making like zero dollars for, for a very long time now, right? So what we see here is that we can see China has made a vote they had a choice between an idea and people laugh and say they are stupid because they want zero COVID, right? And they voted for an idea versus dollars because they could have opened, they could have made the dollars, but they paid for it. And now they're going for an idea. I'm not saying I endorse it. I'm just saying that let's look objectively at, at what's going on. Now, people have also laughed at China and their ghost cities. And it's like, um, just saying they're stupid, like they never plan. Okay? So let's look at some of the things. Like I, I've seen statistics that when people are saying that uh, a lot of the home owners, the home, the properties that are being built, a lot of it is for investment, it's empty, and no one is renting. Very few of it are actually occupied. And then they also laugh at the fact that China and their stupid one-child policy and it's like their, their population is going to half in, in just a few decades because no one's having babies, right? I just want you to pause and think like, you know, um, these metrics, uh, think about the metrics. And then we also look at the asset classes. Seems like majority of it is in property. They have very little in stocks and bonds, which for the longest time thought that, we all thought that this was going to be a very unstable economy. How can it be so imbalanced? But the funny thing is, given what is going to happen in the financial world, right, it's like, I think there are advantages to not having a lot of stocks and bonds there, eh, you know? So the thing is, People are laughing because you've got 65 million empty homes. There's enough to house the entire population of France. And so at this point, think about it. Look at this slide uh, with all my graphs, right? If you think of it from an earth person's perspective, you're like, hee hee, it's like you're going to die, right? But then let's, let's try a different perspective. Huh? Let's think about it. Now, who agrees with me? Just say yes, right? Who agrees with me that in the upcoming years, you take your pick, whether it is like, military conflict or whether it's like climate change or whatever. Is it true that quite a lot of people may not have homes leh, in the next few years? Just, just think about it. Just think about it, right? And um, for a lot of those people who don't have a home anymore, is it very crazy impossible that if somebody were to offer you a, an apartment, uh, they may take a little while to like send electricity and, and water and stuff. Lah, but, but that if it's being offered to some people who don't have house anymore, right, that they might actually say yes. I'm not saying China's going to do this. But what I'm saying is that as an individual doing my research, and I train myself very, very hard to think about the world in a completely different way, that when we think of all these properties as a resource, I can imagine a lot of people who might be very grateful to be offered a home in exchange for potentially you doing your part for society, just saying, just saying, think about it, okay? And so the thing is, then the question is, okay, so let's just consider that maybe it's not China, maybe Ray Dalio is wrong, okay? And it's not China. Then the question is, are there other contenders? Is it possible that the US might continue or maybe some other country might come up? So the thing is, as an earth person, the fact is when we think of the, the contenders, the natural thing is to, what, what do we look for? We look for GDP. We look for who has the best economic um, background, infrastructure, who got money, la, basically. And I'm trying to get, just for the sake of today's presentation, let's just train ourselves to think like air people. It's like, can we take a different perspective? So here's what I'm suggesting. Let's try this. Let's try a different perspective. Now, in the next slide, I'm going to show you a picture of the world map. And it's a, it's a picture that I think some people might take a, a couple of seconds to try and figure out what you're looking at. Because it, it may look very unfamiliar, but undoubtedly it's a real map. Okay, let me show you. So if you look at this, it's clearly a world map. And uh, some people might go like, so where is this, huh? So you might see some familiar names. You can see US, Russia, whatever. And some of you will figure this out. This is the North Pole. And why am I showing you this? Because right now the North Pole looks like this. And I also want to tell you that in my research, I know that our friend Putin has been playing icebreaker games for the last 10, 20 years. And the thing is, it didn't used to be possible because the ice was very thick. But you see, even climate change is in his favor now. 
because now um, ships designed a particular way can cut a hole right across the Arctic Ocean. And Russia is right now already, done already, building an Arctic Silk Road. There's going to be a new trade. And the thing is, this never existed in the Earth era. So guys, I'm asking you to look at things that didn't exist in the Earth era. Okay? And right now, he's already put his money where the bet is. And he's already been building a $110 billion megapod on the Tamiya Peninsula. So it's, it's, it's done. He's building it already. And the other thing is that if you think about how it's like in order for a person to really think very long term, and they're not looking at like whether I make money today or tomorrow. In, and if we look at just this idea of a trend right now, what are, what are going to be the things that we will say is very important in the air era? It's like this climate change thing, uh, whether you believe it's real, whether it's created by men, who cares, right? The fact is the temperatures are rising. It's a fact. And the thing is, once the ice starts to melt, my understanding, I'm not a scientific person, uh, please go and ask a scientific person, that if the ice starts to melt, it actually accelerates the, the rise of the temperatures. So what I'm about to show you is not from me, I just got it from a scientific journal somewhere where scientists have, have speculated on what will happen if the world goes up by four degrees. Just saying, okay? So I'm not saying it will happen, I'm saying scientists have done studies and they said that if it goes up by four degrees, here's what will happen. Now, if you look at this world map, very different because the green section at the top becomes the habitable section. If you want to grow crops, you want to grow food, you want to have animals there, we kind of need to be in a livable temperature. And the thing is the upper half of Canada, the upper half of Russia seems to be quite a nice place to live. While all the other places that are yellow color become a bit hot. Don't know about you guys, I live in Singapore, it's very hot for the last few weeks. So the thing is, it's getting so unbearable, I need aircon almost every day. So just saying, okay, and the thing is, if, if it goes in this trajectory, I'm saying that some factors, some very, very big world factors are, are in the favor of certain ways of doing things and it's not in the favor of certain ways of doing things. So, and on, on top of that, so this is, this is real. I got this from a scientific journal that climate change could make the absolutely frozen Siberia habitable within decades. And think about it, lots of people are going to lose their homes, just saying. And some people have a lot of space. Some people have a lot of homes. Okay. And the other thing that we are looking at is this idea of um, the electric battery. So this is just a picture. But you see, in order to build this idea of an electric vehicle, right now I'm just looking at cars, but the thing is, I mean, fact is the oil thing is not going to last, right? So that means we are going to need a lot of lithium. So here's my research. I've seen that the number three right now in the world producer of lithium is China. That's Australia and Chile as well. And the other thing that we need a lot of is cobalt. And uh, if you look at this graph, the number two producer of cobalt is Russia. And, and the weird thing is that the Democratic Republic of Congo, like that's some insane graph, okay? That Congo actually has 70% of the entire world's cobalt. And here's the part I haven't told you yet. They have 19 major cobalt mines and China owns 15 of them. So the thing is, uh, this is a very misleading graph because actually, yes, it's in Congo. Uh, I understand they're trying to wrestle control back from China, but I mean, the fact is at one point, China owned 15 out of 19 of those months. So the thing is, if we want to look at the new developments, again, let me, let me reiterate that China and Russia didn't do this last year. They've been doing it for decades. Uh, they, it, it wasn't, they've been, they've been there forever. So the thing is, I'm trying to explain to you that if right now you want to excel and you want to win this air game it means that we kind of have to start changing the way we think and the way we make plans and these plans better start now because the thing is if we are planning just like we did in the earth era we're going to be in deep trouble just like the united states and so the thing is i'm very well aware that at least looking from what i see in the media and how people are like freaking out about the war i know these two people are not very popular I'm, I'm aware of that. And am I endorsing them? Not necessarily, I'm an earth person too, right? So I, I'm, I'm like, you know, I don't know what to think. But the thing is, you cannot argue with the fact objectively, if we were to zoom out a bit, that they are both of them doing things that are clearly not for monetary reasons. In fact, they have paid the price. I also want you to consider that a lot of the technologies that they have invested in have not made money for them. So in terms of like GDP, in terms of being able to sort of win in the, in the industrial game, to a large extent, neither of these countries have really been number one in the years leading up to this. So that means they could have, because they are big countries and they could have invested money in the right places to earn lots and lots of money, but it's not, it's not like that. They've invested in the long game. 
everyone here that it's, it's a long game they have thought about they've sat somewhere and they put themselves into a little bubble not listening to the storm around them and they started thinking about what's important 10 years from now 20 years from now and i think this long and short term thing is what's going to determine what's going to happen in the world and then the question is a lot of people asking okay if we don't like these two guys is it possible that we might have an alternative so i i've thought about this guys and i tell you i've studied this astrology thing my god for like years I needed to find a way to what what else is possible so i'm going to show you some stuff like okay and uh so the world economic forum has suggested that okay if this economic thing doesn't work then maybe you own nothing and you'll be happy la. okay so this one got a lot of people upset la, because then it's like well i work so hard then you take away right so and of course there are some other questions that started being asked because the western world is starting to wake up their idea and realize that hey, maybe our way doesn't work eh? so they started asking will social credit system be implemented in the eu and that means the question has already been asked it's not implemented but it's being asked forbes is asking are social credit systems coming to the west forbes eh? and we also have obviously the world economic forum is asking can it now be a a tool to fight poverty so i'm just quoting from articles you draw your own conclusions now at the end of the day here a world economic forum has also suggested a few new things that a digital identity can improve lives they're trying to solve some problems and they're suggesting that if you have some kind of an identity it can link you to finance and travel and telecommunications and let's be straight guys we kind of need all of this stuff to to function to survive and i always think it's very funny that we think of all this as like very advanced technology right but actually not really i just checked my phone and i got one of these things in my phone now so the thing is it's um it's very convenient and it means that as a citizen of my country i actually get to uh, lock into like various things that i absolutely need and i've no doubt that we are just going to add on to this there'll be more and more features along the way like like nobody thinks that it's going to stop here right so the reality is that um, right now, the, there's a lot, the technology is also moving in a certain way and we have to pay attention to where the technology is going. So we're entering the era of the Internet of Bodies, where we are collecting our physical data via a range of devices that can be implanted, swallowed or worn. And in case you think that this is very, like, very like, far away technology, look at this, like Sweden has already uh, started doing this so this article is dated december of last year and they said they had over a hundred participants uh, i've just seen an article that i think they're up to a few thousand participants now so people have this microchip that's like sort of in between their thumb and their index finger and it seems to be working and a lot of the people choosing to get the chips are very young people they are air people who are voluntarily not forced voluntarily getting this chip in their body so and the other concern that people generally have is that oh my god china is a surveillance state they want to collect all your data it should scare everyone atlantic said but you know i i think whether we want to embrace it deny it or reflect reject it right the fact is they are we, all that data is already being collected like hello and on top of that the cia has been conducting like mass surveillance and don't tell me that the cia is the only agency in the world that's collecting data on people so the reality is guys i mean air era right the, the, the fact is i i don't really think it matters like where you are the fact is uh, the story is kind of the same now that's what i'm trying to say and in the and in this is a famous article a lot of you probably know about this already and uh, this is is written by a world economic forum contributor i just quote a few things right so someone said i don't in the year 2030 eight years from now i don't own anything i don't own a car i don't own a house i don't own any appliances or any clothes and some people she also went on to say that one by one all these things became free so it ended up like you didn't actually need to own it okay so the, the thing is there are other things in the article highly recommend you go and read it yourself and draw your own conclusions but what i'm saying here is that is it so crazy just just pause huh? is it so crazy think about it yeah and it much as it's not attractive because i'm an earth person i don't i'm not sure how i feel about this but i i if you ask me as an astrologer is this air yes it is it is air Okay, so the thing is, as we look at to this graph, and uh, there's this speculation about who the new economic power is going to be, then um, I, I, I thought I'd just sort of slip this in. Uh, uh, I'm a bit of a literature person, and I, if you've read this, uh, George Orwell, 1984, he actually made a preposterous suggestion in 1949 that uh, the world might look like this in uh in the future and i i'm starting to think that you know, he he maybe he's he prediction skill better than mine okay so i i'm not saying this will happen i'm saying think about it think about it 
uh, but the big question I'm going to ask you is, does it matter? Does it matter who's going to be the next big power? I think what's important for you is to understand what does that new power, who cares who it is, what does it represent or what does it mean for the average person? And how much of a, of a thinking that has to change in order for you to understand a world that is unthinkable, impossible, and uh, don't be so sure because um, it happened before. So the thing is, I, I want to sort of like let people know that how, how do I deal with this? Because guys, you are listening to it this morning and I'm sure some people have thought about it. But you know, I've grappled with this for the last, by my own count, maybe about five years. I have known for the last five years. And the thing is, webinars are hard, right? It's like you cannot just one shot tell people. I tell you, if I said this in 2020, people would throw eggs at me, you know. But the thing is, now if... For me, I understand because I'm an astrologer and I don't look at like your face or his face. I look at planets. Eh. That means I, I don't look at the world. I don't look at what I have around me. I'm looking at, I'm in outer space and I'm looking at the, the planets. So I'm very clear that it's just another cycle. So that means, yes, the Roman Empire died. The Song Dynasty died. But I'm very clear that the people survived. Because I'm ethnic Chinese. Eh. If, like, if the Song Dynasty people didn't survive, I won't be sitting here. And a lot of you listening to this are ethnic Chinese. So obviously your ancestors survive, right? And that means that there has to be a way for people to go on. So some things are not going to go on, but the people will go on. And that's the important thing that I absolutely want to suggest here. So when we think about the Earth era, here's how I think about it. That we were very good at setting up structures building buildings where all the cities were super like like modern and, and stuff it worked really well honestly honest to god like this is amazing but we are also very good at creating instruction booklets so that means after a while there was a formula that we all followed and for the longest time it worked really well i mean the the thing is the capitalist thing also meant that we wanted to allocate and it was quite fair in the sense that if you did it the best then you earn the most okay so that was that was what we have always um had and accepted but you see, the problem was that it became, the, this instruction booklet was so entrenched that it became too big to fail. And we saw this time and time again. It's like somebody flies an aeroplane into your, your twin towers and it's like people just lost their minds. You mean my instruction booklet doesn't work? And sometimes it doesn't. And then the global financial crisis came out and people again lost their minds. And then like, you know how easily we lose our minds about all sorts of things. And it's very reactionary. So the thing is, a lot of us on the ground, and we all know okay, that, that some things have to change. And we are already accepted that we have to move into the air era. And that means people have started a conversation about how we need to adjust, we need to make, make a movement. The thing is, there are a few obstacles in our way. Because the fact is, look at an example like this. So 45 nations pledge to protect nature and like protect the polar bears and stuff, right? But the thing is, it's easier said than done. You can make a promise. But if you look at this, like the fossil fuel industry, IMF has found, gets subsidies of $11 million a minute. You know, I've spoken for many minutes now. As I'm speaking, uh, well, a few billion dollars just went there. <laughs> just saying. And you know, when, Ru when Russia invaded the Ukraine, what happened was that, you know, there were all these tax cuts, Germany cut, South Africa cut, Portugal cut, basically everyone cut. Lah. And what you were being told was that it's like we had to do that because otherwise the whole economy is going to be in trouble. But I don't know, guys, I mean, a lot of you are drivers, right? And a lot of you are in industries that require fuel of some sort. So the question I want to ask you honestly is like, did it work? Did it bring the price down or did it go up anyway? So in fact, what I want to show you is that what then is possibly the real result of of all these tax cuts is that Chevron actually saw their quarterly earnings go up. Exxon signals record quarterly profits. BP profit doubles on exceptional oil trading. And oil giant Shell reports the highest quarterly profit since 2008. They've had a good year. They've had a fantastic year. So the, the reality is like, we, we know this. Come on guys, this is not news, right? We know this. But you see, what I'm trying to point out here is that at one point, for us as individuals, for me as an individual, the, the system had been planned out for you. And we follow, we just follow until the system failed. Now, I've been an astrologer for the last 10-ish years. And there are my, the nature of my trait is that people come to me and the fact is people tell me their problems. It's, it's the nature of it. And I, I see clearly that one of the things that the Earth era had been very good at is because we had a very good formula. And for most of us, it really worked very well. So that means we copy and paste. 
and uh, so it, it meant that we could produce a lot. We became very efficient at doing a lot of things with as little resources as possible. Now, however, one of the other issues that we face as individuals, and I always get as an astrologer, is that how do I stand out? If you're an insurance agent, they all look the same. If you work for an MNC, everyone looks exactly the same. They wear the same clothes. They talk the same stuff in the, in the meeting room. And it felt that, that people didn't really know. There was only one way to build a city. And everyone followed the same formula. And you see, I think what's going, to, what's going to bother a lot of people, and hang on with me for this, it's very important. This is what helps me to understand how I am going to change in the air era. Because for me, my understanding of what's going to happen in the next two years is that someone went and opened all the Lego box and they all pour the Lego in the middle. So the thing is, some people tell me that, hey, May, we are going to lose everything. I said, no, the hell we won't. Because everything is still there. Look carefully at this picture. All the Lego is still there. The people are still there. The buildings are still there. What, what are we talking about? Now, what we have lost, guys, what I think is not going to work anymore is the box. The box doesn't work anymore. The instruction booklet failed already. So our problem right now is that everything is still there, but we kind of don't really know how to put it back together. Everyone with me? Right, so that means it's like we just don't know like okay so like we got all these people here but then i'm not your manager anymore then like how how we work together like we confuse it we don't know like like if if there isn't a, a system then how's yeah you see so the thing is what i'm what i'm trying to explain here is that stop thinking that you're going to lose everything i think that's a stupid way of thinking about it and it makes you depressed which is crazy because depressed people are not very useful i tell you first huh? So what I'm saying is that let, let's consider another possibility. Because what is going to upset a lot of us is that we couldn't believe that the instruction book was wrong. How can it be? It worked for 100 years. That's what the Song Dynasty person said, right? And that's the guy who didn't survive. And the guy who survived said, hey, let's do it different, no? So now, if we think about the fact that even up to since forever, every city is made out of the individual blocks. And I think right now, we need to think of things in a very different way. Let's stop thinking about the city. We think about the blocks instead. So we don't think so big, we think small because small is more manageable also. And the thing is, when, when I say small, it means that this is what a Lego brick looks like. It's not very remarkable. Like. It has certain characteristics. It's good for certain things and it's not good for certain things. And if you think about this brick can be anything. It can be an individual. It can be a cup that you have in front of you. It can be something, uh, some piece of intellectual property that you have, a skill, whatever it is. Lah. The fact is the whole city that we used to know is all made of all those things anyway. So it's just that we had a way of putting them together. So here's what we want to look at, that it doesn't matter whether you're a caveman or you're a Roman guy or a Song Dynasty guy or just one of us. Lah. The fact is the resources were the same. And I think what everyone had to learn was to create a new system. That means there must be a way. We, we have to first recognize that maybe the old system had some problems, right, that we couldn't resolve. And that means the intelligence, look, the world can burn, uh, but you know your intelligence, the IQ is still there, right? So the thing is, we have to be a bit smarter now. Find a new way. So here's what I'm going to suggest. And uh, the way I'm thinking about this is that we are going to lose some of these earth values. And I think if you hang on to the earth values, you, you need to change your idea a bit. But instead of thinking about the air values, because the fact is, the more I thought about it, that we, we can't, I'll be really frank, I'm an earth person. I, I was born in 1985, like seriously. So the thing is, if you want to tell me, hey, may I can have uh, air values, I think I might, I might struggle with it. And I think you might too. A lot of people told me you struggle with that. So let's change things a bit. Let's talk about a fundamental value. So let's not pretend you're going to be an air person. Maybe your kids will be an air person, but maybe I can't. So let me tell you what I can do. So you see, it's like in the past, it was like this idea of a degree. And people say that, huh, but then if it's like climate change and all this, but I'm not a bio scientist, you know. So that's why we, we got to stop thinking about like the qualification. And I think you want to go down into the fundamental of like, what is the skill and the knowledge that you have? And how many of you have realized that there are bankers who became bakers and they're happier, you know? And there are people who have been super managers who have decided to be mentors in, in a community. Some people are very funny when the young people listen to you. Then some are while well, you talk 10 hours or so, young people don't listen to you. So that means we all have certain characteristics that works for you and sometimes it doesn't work for you. So these are the fundamental skills. That's one thing we think about. Then although nations may fall, that means if they want to like shoot each other, like they want to kill each other's economy, not much. I mean, I'm, I'm a little person, I can't do much about that. But what I do know is that the community is still there. 
that means it's like when we look around you who cares about the big boys the the community we have to work together and that means if we think about money or the way we think about money is going to change drastically like it or not but you see uh, one thing i've learned from studying china and russia so much is that they actually don't care about the money did you realize what they care about was the resources they secured food they secured gold and silver do your do your homework they've secured water supply they secured fuel Right. And, and the thing is, who cares whether you have money or not? What's important is the resources. And that's why you got to start thinking, what are the important resources that we have? And does it mean that if there's no money means there's no resource? Think again, think again, look at what's happening. Okay. And the thing is, when people lose their jobs or their designation, does that mean that we no longer have an earning? Because if the only way you think about earning is salary, then well, I think very hard. Leh. And then if you are waiting for a designation, someone assign you a position then you know how you're going to contribute that's going to be a bit hard because you got to think about like how you're going to participate in this new story that's how people keep asking me me how how do i remain relevant and i know a lot of people keep thinking like you know they keep asking me like what's the next industry that will come out and the fact that you're asking about industry tells me you don't understand this okay so the, the the thing is if you think about the fact that a lot of contracts this idea of contracts are very hard no because a lot of people are going to default on their contract eh? it's gotten to a point where a, a piece of paper that like you sign i sign that we promise each other that one no no use already eh? no one can nobody believe anymore no so that means what might be a bit more important is that when i speak to you directly we decide what we're going to do tomorrow and then we collaborate. Who cares whether there's a contract? You don't need a lawyer to go and like chop and stamp. I tell you, it doesn't matter. And they chop stamp, they still never follow one, correct or not? So the thing is, that's why we want to look at, think about who you want to work with. It's time to change the way and understand that fundamentally a collaboration is still a collaboration with or without the piece of paper. And that sometimes we think of that last time we kept looking for the one best answer. And even in the last two years, you know, people who have come to me, professionally, they keep asking me what is the best thing to do right now. And the fact is, I'll be really straight with you. I was born in 1985. Eh? I wasn't born in the Song Dynasty. Eh? I also don't know what's the best answer. But here's what I can tell you is that let's look at the skills and the knowledge. Let's look at who is with you. And then we put our IQ together and then we start to experiment because surely something is going to work. And that means Think about how China and Russia have done that. They've done a lot of stupid ideas that just didn't work. Eh? Really, you go and do your research. They've really done a lot of pretty damn crazy things. But the thing is, out of 10 things, uh, maybe five work. Eh? And the thing is that five things is, is what is really helping them. While the rest of the world has been doing only what gets the best answer and what has the most money. Essentially, we followed the instruction booklet. And in fact, you realize that what makes the most money isn't what solves the problem. And the thing is, right now, the countries who actually can solve the problem are the ones who might just win this game. And the thing is, the people who only know how to make money and profit out of a system may not win this game because even climate change is not in your favor. Leh. So the thing is, so this is why it's so important. And I've, I've championed this message over and over again in all my webinars. So important. And that means as we look around each other, the fact is the city is made of all these very weird things. And each of us have a very different characteristic. And the thing is, rather than think of you trying to build a whole city by yourself, please don't be crazy. But what you can do is to get together people of all shapes and sizes. And it's like when you put some pieces together, you just don't really know what you can build. And I think it's time to sort of look at people without their net worth, without their designation, just look at what they can do. Some people can speak very well. I'll tell you my PowerPoint slides. No, I do one. Eh. I, I come up with the idea. I'm very good with astrology, right? Somebody designed my, my, my slides for me. Some of you have texted me and say, wow, your background very nice. Got all this video and stuff. Somebody else did the background for me. You think I know how to set up the lights. Eh? So the thing is, what I'm saying here is that when a very small group of people come together and really recognize what each other can do, the fact is you can build stuff. So the, the fact is, first of all, let's, let's be very, very grounded. Uh. Number one, you cannot stop the world from moving to the air era because Biden can't do that, I can tell you. <laughs> He's not. Right? And uh, uh, Boris Johnson not going to do that. So I'm not sure how you are planning to stop the world from going to the air era. But here's the thing. What we have learned from looking at history 
is that this also means that when all the Lego is on the ground, right, it means that somebody better come up with a good idea of how to build it back together. And what I want to suggest to everyone is this is our window of opportunity. You know how when you were born in the 50s, 60s, all the way to the 90s, it, you kind of didn't really have a say about how things work. Like you kind of had to go to school, you kind of had to go get a job. But the thing is, right now, I think in the sense that there's this open space now, that's what Air Era is about, it's an open space. And the thing is, if we can just sort of pause and think, um, if the rules are going to change, and at least for now, nobody really knows what the rules are. You ask me, I also don't know, right? So the thing is, it means that as a community, we can change the rules of how we work together. Must there be a boss and an employee? Must there be a, a specific way of charging your for your services? I'm not sure. I mean, we can experiment with lots and lots and lots of different things because people are very open now. So we can build the air era you want. And what can people do? So the obvious things are like, there's going to be a lot of technology because uh, some of the old ways that we have used to get our resources a bit never, don't work already. La. So that means we know that our electronics, la, appliances, like no electricity a bit hard. La, okay? So that means that some of you here have technical expertise. And instead of perhaps doing what might sell more appliances or whatever, that we might kind of look at new ways of working with technology. And by the way, all these pictures I'm showing you, these are real Lego creations by like, like regular people. It's not by Lego. They just bought and they created their own things and they posted online. I think it's amazing. Okay. So the thing is, um, different types of technology of all sorts, but also there's a group of us who may not be so good with technology. And in fact, what we want to go into is the other side of Aquarius, which is the community. That means getting people together, maybe it might mean if we simplify things a bit, go back into the fundamental values, community, resources, helping people, making sure that each person has what they need while we sort of like figure out like how we're going to reorganize things again. But that means we need to be creative. That means there's no instruction booklet to follow right now. There isn't a boss who's going to bug instructions at you like, yay, right? But the thing is, it also means that we kind of need to be able to, to try and we need to listen to each other in the way that we never listened to each other before. So yes, uh, so I'm going to just give you a frame to think about this. Okay, so some people said, hey, May, are you saying that we go air era means no need resources? I still need to eat. Eh? Got, got that, right? Sure, of course, you need resources to function. But let me give you a different frame. Okay, so that means let's think of between short term and long term. And even if you look at all these conflicts that's happening, I told you about Russia and China, how long the, the outlook is. That means, uh, Today, as you come to my, my forecast, please don't go and think about what like in three months time, this thing going to happen. We better go and do this. Then you end up freaking out. But you know, some people are very calm. Eh? You know, like when, just so you know, when, when uh, the sanctions happen, right? you know how all of Europe went like this. Eh? You know, Putin just sit there like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? No? It's like they sanctioned him and eh? then he like that. Eh? So the thing, I'm not saying he's a great guy. You know? I'm saying that he's doing something that a bit smart. Eh? I think we should, we need to get a bit smarter. You know? So that means in the short term, think about the mindset. A lot of people are driven by profit driven objectives. Look at what the World Bank was doing. Wow, well, they're going to have war. Let's prepare a loan. <laughs> it's like not solving the problem. Eh? And also, but you see, what we want to look at is if you own a company, if you have a, a team of people that you really like working with and you know that we all want to like get something going, then instead of thinking about how we're going to make money first, let's talk about the, the purpose. What outcome do we want and how does this help society? Number one thing. And also, you realize that the people who are very short-term thinking, they are very reactionistic. Wow, Putin invade. Uh, okay, let's sanction him. Then they start getting together and they start losing their minds. Then when COVID happened, look at how many people rush to sell masks, sell hand sanitizer. And then what happened when COVID ended, then they tell uh, now we, what we do with our business. Uh. So you see, when we are driven by the profit opportunity, here's the biggest problem is that we end up not knowing what to do next. We keep waiting and then we get scared because we're like, oh, how, how every time things change only you, you lose your minds. But you see, when we get into a long-term thinking, it is very intentional. So the thing is, how does China build a, a, a railway right across Europe? It's intentional. I can tell you in the short term, they never make money because you only spend it. <laughs> then you gotta go and figure out how to like negotiate with people and have people allow you to build a, a railway when they don't like you. Eh. So the thing is, so the, the fact is we have to be very intentional. And the best part is that it allows our entire team to know what we are doing. And you remember that picture when you are able to stand there in a storm and not be worried about what's happening is because we know exactly what we are doing at any point and it doesn't change with the storm. Now, the last thing is that you also don't want, you want to get out of this soft later mindset. 
Now, a lot of people know that it's going to be a bit of a mess, lah. Sorry, lah. Okay, but the thing is, a lot of people are looking at like, never mind, lah. Anyway, stock market going to crash, so let's going to be reactionistic. Let's be profit driven. I know lots of people who are waiting for the thing to crash so that they can profit from it. But the thing is, it's a very short term thing. And if you ask them, well, what's the long term solution out of this? They say, never mind, lah. Make money first, solve later. But you see, it is the solve later mindset that has caused. A lot of the problems, and I don't think this mindset is going to help us. In fact, what I would say is, let's change it. Let's do a solve now mindset. And I I suspect that this is what has allowed China and Russia to get an edge over everyone else because they understood that we have a problem right now. They don't wait like we make money first thirty years later. When the problem come up, then we think about it. Not not a good way. So guys, as I show you in my in my forecast so far, as early as next year, the world going to tobale. It's going to turn on its head. We go to see things that we we don't understand, eh? so that's why it's very important for us to realize that at least in the here and now, don't go and care about what Putin is doing. You cannot influence this. But let's look at our community. What might be some of the things that we could be dealing with, and how can we get our skills and knowledge together? I don't care whether you have a degree or not. If you know how to do something, do it, right? So the thing is, let me show you some examples. Let's let's. I show you a lot of bad stuff today. Let me show you the good stuff. That actually, if you look at this picture, is Saudi Arabia. Now we all know that what makes money for Saudi Arabia is petrochemicals. Now, if you are a scientist, it makes more sense to go and work for a petrochemical oil company. You, you, your salary is higher. Eh? But you know what they've gone and done? They solved their problem now, which is that they've understood food supply is going to be a problem, and these guys are growing food in the desert, and so that's why. What I'm saying here is that can you see how they didn't do this last year?、Eh? They didn't wait until got no food, then they grow.、Eh? They grow already. And here's the biggest irony is that if there's going to be a food supply problem, we could be buying from the country that is in a desert. Think about it. Now let me show you another picture. This is in Barcelona, in Spain. Now what you see here is an aerial photograph. This is not a concept. Now this is a photograph, and each of these things are known as a super block. So what they are trying to do is this is an experiment where they want to solve problems of like、um, too many cars and there's pollution and also they are trying to find ways for people to live in a more sustainable manner and to have affordable housing because then people can't afford to live in a proper place and we we need to be in in a some kind of ecosystem. So a bunch of architects came up with this idea of a super blocks and that they wanted to build it, but just so you know, they were not. Successful immediately because a lot of people object to it. They say it is not sustainable. It's not profitable. Profitable is the important one. That um, who's going to pay for this? Then it's like you destroy my thing. Then how? But you know, some people they really push for it. And the, maybe to a Singaporean, this is like not much because we kind of have this, and it looks a bit like Robertson Key, right? But the thing is, for Europe, this is a major thing. And when they've designed it, they've changed the design as they go along. They started incorporating sustainable technology. They've started to get people to redefine what it means to be in a community. What kind of schools are there? How do people contribute within a super block? And you know what? They eliminated the cars. No more cars. They don't need the cars anymore. And it's 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 wonderful. People are trying to find a problem and a solution. Now this thing is called Orca, and it is in Iceland. While the rest of the world is busy like adding carbon to the air, these things actually remove carbon from the air. Now right now this thing is not very efficient. It doesn't work very well. But there are a bunch of of engineers who, instead of working for the industries that will pay them the most money, have actually gone to an industry that doesn't produce any money. Not well, not 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 that it's not any money, but it doesn't pay. Half as well as what as what the the big petrochemical companies or or the the pharmaceutical companies will pay you, but they're trying to solve a problem. Right, right now, this is the early version of a of a device like that. But I think you will agree with me. Give it two, ten, five years, that eventually somebody is going to figure out a way to make this machine a lot more efficient, so that we can actually suck a lot of that carbon out of the air. So that I'm not sure they can solve climate change, but maybe they can. Slow things down, lah. I don't know, lah. Okay, but also if we look into what the Gen Z is doing, it seems that even in countries like Singapore, not just Singapore but worldwide, that lots of young people are actually starting their own business. And if you think about it, how old are Gen Z? Just logically, right? They are at most in their mid twenties. Here's what they don't have: they don't have a million dollars. They don't have years of experience. They don't even know how companies work most of the time. Sometimes it's they never had a job for heaven's sake. 
for the, the thing is, so if anyone is telling me that I don't have the capital, I don't have experience, I don't know what I'm doing, I've only ever been an employee, I call bullshit on that. Because the reality is that a lot of young people are realizing that what's the point of joining a company if what they are doing is mostly the short term profit thing and they're not actually solving problems in the world. So the thing is, can we consciously do that on our own? I think so. And over the last couple of years, I've been very heartened by people who have written to me, they have um, sort of given me an update about how they have actively gone and designed that. They've gotten a team together, they identified what they don't know how to do, and they went and learned it. Sometimes Google is your friend, a YouTube video of five minutes, and you can learn a lot of stuff, don't need a degree, don't need to attend course. Right, so the thing is, there's a lot of stuff that we can do. And if each person does a bit, right, I think there's a lot of things that we can change. And let's grab those Lego bricks and let's redefine how we're going to use it. Don't follow the old instruction booklet already. So the thing is, um, for us in Singapore, like some of the problems, I mean, you can actually see that Singapore is racing to try and find a solution for the food supply. And also the fact that we are so hot here and it's almost crazy that it's taken us so long to even go and figure out like this solar power thing. Some of you here have technology expertise. Go do something about it, you know, just a bit of your time. And also for the rest of the people, like dealing with mental health and especially as the world changes a lot, I don't think it's just the youths who are having mental by psychological and emotional problems. I think a lot of people are going to have it. So for the people who understand what's going on and who want to help, can we create communities that's going to support each other? And I think this is way more important than knowing when your next bonus is going to be, honestly, really. So the thing is, I believe that one of the biggest mistakes that um, the leaders had made in the Earth era, and this is from 17 years of doing astrology, is that they made people believe that you have nothing to contribute. They say like just follow. Like some some smarter person came out with a good with a good instruction, and then you just follow. And the thing is, it made a lot of people lose their confidence, such that when you want to go and do something and and express yourself, you essentially convince yourself that it won't work. That is decades of people convincing you that you have nothing to contribute. Now I believe that if we are going to the air era, let's be really straight here. There are a lot of problems coming up, and that means that the solutions have to come from regular people. But it means that we have to be willing to stand up. We have to be willing to speak up. And most importantly, we have to be willing to try. That means it's like, if I mean, you, you don't try, it's not that like you're going to succeed anyway. So might as well try. See, to me, that's what I, I really believe. So think about what you want to create. And if I may, I'll just sort of introduce some ideas for you if you are planning your next step. Because if you understand the message that I'm trying to give you in this webinar, it means that we might need to make some very different plans. Some people understood my message from many webinars ago, and some people are maybe only getting it now. That actually, you've got to start from, don't start from where we used to start. I think we need to start from scratch. Just put yourself in a place, I don't know, find yourself a quiet place, maybe find a few people that you really trust, and start thinking about like, what kind of problems do you want to solve? Like, is there... Is that a purpose? A lot of people ask me, May, what's my life purpose? A purpose means you have to solve a problem, right? And that also, like, what changes do we want to see? It's easy to complain about the Earth era, but the thing is, now we have a chance. We have a window of opportunity to redefine the rules. And also, do you have any skills that, that can be applied to this? And if you don't, let's be straight about what skills you don't have and do you need to watch some YouTube videos to get yourself up to speed? Nothing that you can't handle in two days. Trust me on this. I learned a lot of things in the last two years. Right? And also, what resources do we need? And it's not always money. And I can tell you a lot of things can be done without a million dollars. You don't need a million dollars. And sometimes the resources are more like the people of the know-how. And perhaps just getting something going. Just get started. And also, like if you're going to be part of a team, be honest about what you can and cannot do. And then think about who do you want in your team. And it's not necessarily the old people. It's not the same people that we used to work with in a company. Question, do you really need an accountant per se? Like, you know, do you really need, like, there are some things that we simply assume that we will need, but I don't know. Maybe you need to start questioning and challenging that kind of stuff. So the thing, the most important thing is, are you willing to try? And if you are willing to get a small team of people, and I don't know if it means anything to you guys, but when I run a, a mega webinar like this, just so you know, my whole team uh, is like three plus one person. We only have three full-time people and one, one or two people come in to help us here and there, but that's how small my team is. So don't come and tell me that we need a mega company to get things done. I, I don't think that works. So the thing is, for, for me at least, like if a lot of people are able to do this on your own and lots of people have emailed me and I'm glad, 
So that's the whole point of this webinar is to get people to understand what's coming up. But I'm also aware that because we are Earth era people, it's very hard to just redefine it. And if we look at this concept of that brick, because we've been conditioned for so long that your as a brick, you knew what box you belong to because you were told that you are is that you know instruction booklet has the content page right where they tell you which pieces are where so there was always something for you to belong to but once you remove that box a lot of people get very confused that means you are not even even sure what your skills are so the thing is what, what for me i i've got a lot of people asking like okay so that means if you are at all interested if astrology is able to show us what's going to happen i can tell astrology may not be very good at showing you like what career to go into not because astrology failed but because not much of a career to go for uh, not at least in the old way but the thing is what astrology is very good at is getting into the fundamentals what exactly is there how can we tell who is good with kids how can we tell who are the people who might be better with the technology stuff? I can tell you a lot of the posts that you see on Instagram. I'm not very good at short posts. I'm very good at long webinars, right? So that means the short posts, I'm going to need some help. But the thing is, you know how there isn't a profiling tool somewhere that will tell you that, oh, you're very good at long and you're very good at short. It doesn't. Only astrology tells you that. So which means that if you are one of those persons who might appreciate having a bit of a, a tool to use that you can sort of uh, reflect and to really see what is it about you you know a lot of my students they they are so surprised uh, when they come to class and there are people saying that wow you are really good at this thing and they get surprised that there are people reaching out to them and saying that hey we, we need someone with your with your skills are you are you willing to come and like explore with us if you want to do something with us and it's not like a traditional job offer no. it's people saying like you want to work together and do something and to them is they are so surprised you mean this thing that i have is like you mean people want it because that means you have to start thinking about what skills do you have that doesn't belong on a CV. Eh? You know how on my CV, I'm not going to write very good at running long webinars. It's, that's not something that belongs on my CV. But the problem is a lot of people think that this is going to be a magic pill. Now, if you're looking for a magic pill, um, there are people selling magic pills. You, you need to go and buy those, not, not astrology. Astrology requires a tool means you have to work on it. And also the thing is, you're going to need to want to have to solve problems. And astrology can give us a very good sense of what problems you can solve. Some people... Um, try to do certain projects and they, they realize afterwards that the effectiveness is not as good. You probably want to leave that to somebody else to do. And the thing is, the purpose of this is not to be able to complain and say that this is all my failures because look guys, there's no time. There's no time to complain about stuff already. And also that we want to sort of address rather than avoid. Because a lot of people think that if, oh, if you go and do some astrology thing that perhaps we can decide like, oh, can I avoid this? Can I escape to another country? Can I just do, but I think, no, we have to kind of address that, that this issue is there. So we find a solution, don't avoid it. Okay, so running away is just not going to be the way to do this. And also that means we, it works if you are looking for a team. And it is wonderful when you see people reaching out to each other and saying that, let's do this thing together. Because let me tell you, in the Earth era, a lot of people are looking for a boss. They are looking for me. Can you tell me what industry I should go to? What kind of company should I apply to? And if you're looking for a boss, first, there aren't going to be a lot of these bosses around and you might not like the, like the bosses. Last time, people didn't really like the boss either. So the thing is, let's change that. Let's work with the team. And also when you think about an action plan, like it's, if you are looking for a prediction, look guys, first half of my, con of my webinar, we only talk about prediction. Not like you can do anything about it, isn't it? But right now, what we are seeing here is that you got to start thinking about an action plan. And if knowing what's about to happen means that you change your plans accordingly, now we are talking. And also the fact is some people are still wanting to wait. I already said March 2023, what else are you looking for? So the thing is, you, you are either ready to make a change or you are just going to wait and see law, see whether May is correct or not, then okay, la, then we can wait. La. But the only thing I want to tell all of you sincerely is this is already my eighth, ninth webinar. I haven't been wrong so far, you know. You cannot bet on the possibility that I could be wrong again. So the reality is that I don't think we, we have to be, get very clear about what are the, what are the things that is going to determine who can move forward and who will not. Okay, so I, I didn't create this webinar to, to sell anything. The reality is that what's more important to me is that people actually move. And the thing is, I understand a lot of people are confused. And the reason why I know that is because a lot of people come to my class, they are very confused. And the thing is, they are fantastic people, but it's, it's very hard to get around the fact that, wow, we have to work in this totally new way. And I've been very heartened by the fact that um, just yesterday, somebody told me that they had left their job 
and they've actually gone and trained themselves in counseling and because this person is a teacher and is very good with working with young people and she's decided that working as a teacher in that particular organization is more about getting people to pass the exams than to get people to be strong and she's made that decision there are people who left um positions in very large companies because they've recognized that they've got lots of ideas they want to change things but the boss is not listening and so they decided that either I find a team of people who kind of want to make this idea happen and they don't mind experimenting and trying it, uh, or at the very least, I feel that if I need to build it myself and show people I've got results and have some people join me, that could work. And you know what I'm saying? That in the short run, they, these people are not going to be the millionaires. They are not. I can tell you that. But I can tell you that in the air era, I suspect these people are going to be the leaders. Because if they tried a few things, they know it works. And in times of crisis, we are looking for people who know what works. And it's not, um, and I think at the end of the day, uh, we need to start looking at a shift in priorities. Okay, so for everyone else, um, please take the time. This is the weekend. Please take the time to just have a rest, but also maybe get together with the people that you care about and start ma ma making different kind of goals, different kind of objectives. And perhaps you might want to relook the activities that you're planning for the next one to two years and start thinking about how you can best use your time, get in the real skills and the knowledge that could really make a difference to how we use all the Lego bricks that's going to be lying around and we can change the rules. Okay, so that start thinking about what you want to change. All right, so with that, uh, I'm just going to leave this there. Okay, so this is a, it's a QR code to a WhatsApp. So this is how you can get in touch with us. And some people will want to learn astrology, that will take a bit of effort. But you see, learning means that we pick out all the little pieces, the jigsaw pieces, and we also guide people in how to put it together. I don't know what your next career is going to be, because one thing I can tell you is probably not a career. But the thing is, start thinking about where you are not so strong. And also, be honest about it. And then you know what kind of team members you need, because that has been transformative for me. It's given me a lot of clarity about who I need, and I tell you, we appreciate each other so much and look at what we are able to do, just three people. And also, um, that I understand that there are people with more, um, more urgent concerns, uh, you can look at a consultation. Now, having said that, uh, I want to be very clear that I, right now, at this moment, we are very busy and, and I'm telling you the truth. So, which means that if you, if you do want to look at this, I only see leaders. So that means you need to be somebody who is absolutely willing to step up and start something. So either you have already started something, you've got people following you, you, you I'm looking for people who can make things happen and that you actually are very sincere about getting something going. Because I can tell you, I get lots of people ask me if I do this, will we be very rich and can we profit from this thing? And uh, I want to be really honest with you. It's like. Uh, my purpose here is not to make your money. My purpose here is to move as many people in the right direction as possible. Okay, so um, get in touch with my guys. Uh, it's like they, they, they have done this for a very long time. Okay, and we, we sincerely want to do this. So for everyone else, there is a Telegram channel. We're getting a conversation going, right? So that means I'll be giving a lot of updates as we go along. Uh, some of it will be in the form of voice memos. Some people seem to like that. We're going to be putting up some of, some things are better as articles. And we also let you know that if I make more videos, that uh, if I want to show more stuff to people and I'm going to put it on YouTube, uh, you can get in touch with us also via the Telegram channel. Okay, so um, the date today is 14 of May 2023. We have about eight months before we hit March of 2023. And uh, it's not like things end there, it's just things will change. Right? And I hope that uh, you are getting in touch with the people you care about and start making a very good change. Okay, so uh, with that, I'm thank you all of you. Uh, it seems that I'm ending on time this time around. And I thank you for joining me today. And I'll see you guys in the next webinar.